Hello everybody, Charles here. Welcome to Mythological. I'm coming to you in post at the moment, unfortunately, because we had a little bit of a sound error during the recording of this podcast. We were recording in person today, and what we didn't realise was that Crofty's microphone was also picking up my voice, so that meant that we unfortunately had a bit of a doubling effect on my voice. Apologies if this is distracting, we would normally have re-recorded the podcast as a result, but we're both quite busy at the moment, Crofty's in the process of moving halfway across the country soon, so we thought it was better to just go ahead with what we had. Apologies, and we will make sure this doesn't happen again. All right, thank you guys, and on with the show. Hello, Crofty. Hello, Charles. And hello, everybody. Hello. So, for every single one of the pre... Well, I say every single one. For the two previous recordings that we have done, it's just been a little bit of a while because this is a monthly show, I keep forgetting. The intention has been for us to come and record in person, be able to talk to each other and play off each other in a natural fashion. Until today, that hasn't happened, but we're finally on top of it, Crofty. We're finally in the same room recording. Yep, two metres apart. Yep, two metres apart, as required. We will not uh, mention the reason why, because of YouTube algorithm reasons. So, Crofty, you chose the previous topic of what ended up being two podcasts rather than one. I think yes. we had wanted... So we had wanted it to be less than that, so to speak. We wanted to get it all done in one, but it turns out we're exactly the type of people who we want to show our work in. We are that insecure kid at school who uh, actually liked the idea of having to show his working in maths class, but it showed how smart he was and how good at researching he was. Mm. Oh, who was told to write 10 pages and wrote 20. Yeah, I was that, I was that kid. <laughs> um, so you chose the last one. I got to choose the topic this time. And I rather foolishly thought, hmm, let's go for someone like one of the big ones, the big name characters in mythology that anyone in the Western Hemisphere will know instinctively if you say the word. And that word is Arthur. I made the mistake of choosing King Arthur. <laughs> the reason I did this is I thought that this would be quite a linear story to tell. I was not that familiar in terms of like the historical background behind Arthur. And I think Crofty, both of us, knew most of our knowledge from more the pop culture of King Arthur. Yeah, yeah, that's where I got a lot of my knowledge from. And what interested me early on was how both how wrong and how right I was about what are elements of pop culture surrounding King Arthur. So, you know, certain things you would hear, and I'd think oh, that's definitely made up at a later date. That's, you know, a mo very modern thing in the last 20 years that adaptations have added. That You then look back and go, no, that was part of that on day one. That was in there from the beginning. So let, I think it would be good for us to start by mentioning what, what works do we know King Arthur from at this point? Coming in before we did the research, I'll throw out an example. The Sword in the Stone, the Disney film. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a common one. Yeah. Next to that, my mind goes to the actually quite terrible 2004 film, King Arthur. Don't think you ever saw that one. Yeah, you count yourself lucky. <laughs> so that's the Clive Owen, you know, Kira Knightley oh, uh, yeah. picture. Guy who played Lancelot, I have no idea what his name is. And that, again, is one of those where I thought they've taken huge liberties with this. And obviously they had to flesh it out to a movie um, to consist with like a movie storytelling fashion. It's a surprising number of elements in there that, again, have been in there from the beginning and mm. that are recognisable parts of the Arthurian canon. So outside of that, everything else I really knew about King Arthur was like just osmosis over time. He was known for Knights of the Round Table, Sword in the Stone, Merlin, all these elements. I didn't really have any appreciation of which parts of the canon they came from mm. at all. I don't know about you, Crofty. Yeah, I'm about the same. Like, I... I researched it some more recently when I rewatched BBC's Merlin series, realizing that they pretty much threw everything that they could into that in some way or, or another. Yeah, I think when you need to fill out that much TV, you're going to find even the obscure bits and pieces. So that's the background that we came to this from. I think we're in a bit of a different situation to the previous episodes we did on dragons, which is where 
I think we'll recognize all developments as we go along. Like, like, oh yeah, that's very, very obvious. But we will not know where it came from originally. Hmm. So in addition to the pop culture kind of side of Arthur, I thought we would be remiss if we didn't begin by exploring the idea of Arthur outside of mythology. So obviously when we were dealing with dragons, we were dealing with clear mythology, maybe have some real world inspirations like the fossil record, large mammal bones, etc., that would have then gone on to inspire mythology. But when it comes to Arthur, there is a vast debate that has raged for centuries. Was he a historical figure? So, Crofty, what do you think? I think probably not. But that, obviously, if I'd been, coming, been asked that question without the knowledge of having read old mythology, having, you know, having the knowledge of a 21st century person, essentially, then my answer might be rather different. Mm. He was quite commonly believed to have been a real historical figure until I think it was the 16th century. Yeah, I'm going to get into that when I talk about some of the more influential accounts. Mm. Um, there, there are a lot of what we would now consider mytholo- like obvious mytho- mythological additions to accounts that were just treated as verbatim history for mm. a long period. So... My general thought on this, after reading some relative authoritative accounts, so there was an account by, I'm searching for the name here, Caitlin Green wrote a 2007 academic survey that kind of went into a little bit the historical possibilities of there being, you know, either a king in sub-Roman Britain by the name of Arthur, or a figure that was just like a local warlord or something who became kind of historical core that then these tale that got turned into a mythological figure later on. And then people came back and tried to historicize him and find the real Arthur, so to speak. Her opinion on the matter after surveying it, and you can actually read this book she wrote, if you basically go to Wikipedia and you find the underlying reference behind most of the early origins on King Arthur, the 2007 book is the main ref- reference that's given. What she also did, because her book was out of print for a few years, is she basically freewared the book and just said, here's the PDF, anyone can have it if you want. So if you follow the basic links there, you can find the entire book. So that's where some of my knowledge on the early parts of Arthur came from for this. Her thoughts were, you have two, you have like a difference between a historical character who then gets an associated mythology. So an example of that would be Charlemagne, who definitely was real. We have contemporary accounts and biographies of him from that period but then gets pulled into the larger mythology of France, the matter of France, the paladins, Roland, all this was built around Charlemagne. The other side of things is a mythological character who is then turned into a historical character. So an examples that she gave of this were things like Hengist and Horsa, who were supposed to be the leader of the Anglo-Saxons when they invaded Britain in the 5th century. As far as anyone can tell, they're actually just a pair of totems that were worshipped on the continent, uh, like two twin horse gods, similar to the twin gods of the Romans as well, that were later turned into lead into the leader of the Saxon forces. And then a much closer to home example would be someone like Merlin. So Merlin was basically a combination of a figure who appeared in a later saintly life that would be known to anyone from Scotland as Saint Mungo, uh, which is actually uh, Saint Kentigern, I think is the actual name of the saint. The saint. It's a combination of like a 6th century Scottish hermit by the name of Lyloken with the local place of Caerfidden. Uh, this is a Welsh pronunciation, so it's going to be awful. That eventually resulted in the kind of Welsh figure of Myrdin, M-Y-R-D-I, sorry, double D-I-N. So, That's the kind of possibilities that you get with these sort of figures. Her conclusion was that it's more than likely that Arthur was purely a mythological figure from the get-go, and that he potentially... There are some arguments about, oh, well, there's names from the 6th century of Arthur which pop up an awful lot. Maybe it's people who have been named after this famous figure. It's just as likely they were named after the mythological figure, and he appears to have been a popular figure right from the beginnings of Welsh traditions in poetry. 
So how we've kind of separated this up, Crofty, is I'm going to explore the early origins of this figure, go all the way up into kind of, I call the Middle Ages, I think, say, 14th century onwards. Yeah. At which point you'll take over and look at how how King Arthur developed kind of post-romance. Yeah. In terms of uh, kind of the chronology of his development and all the way up to how it was interpreted in more modern times. Whereas I, now, I'm going to have to introduce Arthur to the world again, it seems. So, in terms of the early canon of King Arthur, Arthur first appears in early Welsh poems from about the 6th century onwards. There are several strains to this thought, and I think we have to identify two major separations in thought when it comes to the Arthurian canon, which are what is referred to as pre-Galfridian and post-Galfridian. This is in reference to a figure who we actually spoke about in our last episode, Geoffrey of Monmouth. So the Arthurian canon up until this point is very different from what Geoffrey of Monmouth made. So, Crofty, do you know anything about Geoffrey of Monmouth in particular? Now that he was a historian in the 12th century, I believe, who wrote the Historian Britannica that was generally considered to be very, very embellished. So more sort of in the vein of Herodotus, where claims to be a historian, but a lot of it is very unfounded. Yeah, that's probably the best way to think of Geoffrey of Monmouth. So there are a fantastic number of sources for the early Arthur of the Welsh, of Welsh mythology. I'm not going to try and go through them all today because we'd be here for about six hours before I even got to Geoffrey of Monmouth, let's put it that way. But there is a rich corpus of material, so this includes things like collections of heroic death songs, early poetry, kind of early saints' lives that Arthur appears in as well, and also the Welsh triads. So these are a series of 96 Welsh mimetic devices used to kind of train, train your poetic memory. And they're usually like a pairing of free names or persons to do with a land. And they often just very short little snippets as a result. Arthur figures quite prominently in those. I won't go into them today because there's a whole gigantic body of them to go through. But Arthur basically appears in them early on. as kind of like this unparalleled warrior figure. And then he slowly develops through the triads to the point where the court of Arthur, so to speak, becomes synonymous with Britain as a whole. So there are three strains of these early traditions. So the first of these is Arthur appearing as a peerless warrior. He appears in this form from the earliest of tales. There doesn't seem to be like a developmental phase where, you know, he's a minor character and he becomes embellished upwards later to become the main star of the show. He just immediately is a peerless warrior. So his main form of functioning is as kind of the protector of Britain, and he appears more as a contender with supernatural creatures. And I'll get into that in a minute. But an example of how well regarded he was by, let's say, the 6th and the 7th century is in a collection known as the Ur Gododin, which is a collection of heroic death songs. It's kind of attested to later in like, I think it's something like the 10th and 11th centuries, the current version we have of these is written. And there are a lot of arguments as to where its earliest components date from. In particular, there are huge arguments about the Arthurian sections if it was inserted late, much, much later. There's like a theoretical reconstruction that's been done that puts Arthur back in and says, yes, he was there from the earliest point. That's highly disputed. All there actually is in there is a line for a warrior who, upon killing 300 opponents, is said to have, quote, fed black ravens on the rampart of a fort, although he was no Arthur. That's all we have is just that little glimpse in there of Arthur. But it's clear already he's considered this peerless warrior. The second strain of thought for Arthur is kind of more as a figure of folklore. So it's more associations with like um, localized magical wonder tales. So a good example of this is I saw a story that is basically him meeting with the gatekeeper of a particular castle and the gatekeeper demanding 
his deeds in order to be allowed to enter. And he gives a long recital of his various contentions and exploits. The example I have, I think, that best sums up this strain of Arthur is from a text known as the Mabinogion. This is a collection of Welsh tales that the, like the earliest written version comes to us from between the 11th and the 12th century. But it, when you read it, and from various academic examinations of it, it's clear that it preserves older or like oral storytelling traditions. So when you come to a lot of things like, say, the Irish mythological cycles, when you read them, they're clearly written just in prose, and it's difficult to tell what is like an oral element that's been kept in there to aid memory before the written record caught up with it. When I read through a couple of snippets of the Mabinogion, it's very clear that these are designed to aid memory. There's a lot of repeated elements in there. So the example I have, this is a bit of a later text, is the story of Cullock and Olwen. So this is a story of the lad Cullock, who is cursed by his stepmother to marry only the, daughter, the beautiful Olwen, who is the daughter of a giant whose name I can barely pronounce. <laughs> Let me try. This uh, Penqua. So I just forgot every single element of Welsh grammar that I learned. <laughs> so I learned things like um, the double L is flea, um, things like F is pronounced V. I just threw that all to the winds <laughs> there, basically. I hope there's no Welsh listeners playing the uh, mispronunciation drinking game. Yeah, that's going to be <laughs> a high score. But yeah, So he's basically tasked with marrying the daughter of a giant. And this reminds me very much kind of of the, the kind of the heroic labours of Hercules. I've got the thing of this, where he goes to try and, on a quest to try and find this giant and he meets relatives of the giant who have been horribly persecuted by the giant. I think uh, there's a woman who says that the giant has killed her first 23 sons and she's had to hide her 24th son from him to, to allow him to survive. They lead, her, they lead Kulluk to the court of this giant, and the giant basically gives Kulluk a huge list of potential tasks for him to complete. It's interesting to read because there's just like 40 of them in a row. You read them all the way through. And at the end of every single one, Kulluk essentially says, you may think that is hard to do, but not I. And this, and you can see like the oral storytelling of it going on, how they're remembering that I end each one with this, this phrase each time. So Kulluk is the cousin of Arthur. Some of the earlier stories refer to him as like a war leader, or they don't actually say that he is a king. In this version, which is quite later on in the Welsh tradition, he is explicitly called the chief of the kings of this island, meaning Britain. Cullock goes to Arthur and basically says, will you, you know, I will dishonour you if you don't help me complete these tasks. So Arthur caves and helps him out with these tasks. And it's interesting... Reading this story, I feel like I'm missing like a, an entire lifetime's worth of storytelling background because there's these big, big lists of tasks, and it's clear that these names and figures are significant within the wider body of Welsh poetry. I don't have that context. So the right, the, how they resolve each of these tasks kind of follows my thought process reading them, which is the first two or three tasks are described in depth, how they're completed. And then there's just a big list of, yes, Arthur did it. Arthur did this, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. And this repeated listing also appears earlier. So when Arthur, is, like his court is first introduced, you get, here's Arthur, here's his Seneschal, K, here's the figure which then evolves into Bedouin, which is Bedoyer, I think in the Welsh version. I'm trying to remember how to pronounce the W as an O-U sort of sound. And then there's like figures like Gal, uh, Galshime, um, Gwihir, and people like that. These are like, um, this big list of names goes on for pages again. There's like 200 different warriors. 
And you can see some of the names in there that are going to eventually become the Knights of the Round Table in Lady Draftorian Myth, but it's still kind of not particularly developed. So what basically happens is Arthur completes all these tasks for his cousin, and they go back to the giant, and the giant says, yes, you have completed all these tasks. I went out of my way to try and stop you from completing them, and I didn't expect that Arthur would have helped you, because there's a bigger side as to why. And what then basically happens is the 24th son, who was concealed from the giant, then comes in and kills the giant. <laughs> and Kaluk marries Olin, or Olin, or however it's pronounced. So that's that main story. That gives you a good idea of how uh, Arthur's kind of seen. And there many of those tasks are to you know, deal with supernatural creatures. There's like a long side about them finding these particular sacred oxen for this particular plow and all these was one of the tasks. So that's kind of that second strain, I think, in body. So you've got the war leader, and then you've got the contention with supernatural creatures, and kind of like acting like as a folk hero. The third and final strand of these is Arthur's has a close association with the Welsh underworld, and he's known to have journeyed there. So the Welsh underworld, I'll make sure I get this pronunciation correct, is called Anu. A double N W N, but the W is like an O U sound. Anun. So the most significant reference to this is found amongst a surviving document known as the Book of Taliesin, I think it's called. So I was kind of familiar with this already because over the course of me making my Druids video, Crofty, I came across this. And I came across it in the context of a bloke called Yolo Morganog. I think this was his name. He was like a, an 18th century Welsh fraudster who claimed to be a bard and all, all this, and basically made up texts and added them on to Welsh mythology. And I'll talk about him when I eventually get around to doing a video on that subject. But to cut to the chase, the Book of Taliesin, he basically like added a load of stuff to it and claimed that, um, it, that it was in there from the beginning and he rediscovered it, but no, he just made it up. The Book of Taliesin is a collection of 56 poems. And as far as scholars can tell, 12 of these poems likely date from the 6th century. So we're talking back in the sort of era where Arthur in later historical narratives is placed. It's con it seems to be quite contemporary. And one of these poems, with the most significant, is called The Spoils of Anun, and it uh, chronicles Arthur's descent into the underworld and to try and steal the spoils of the underworld. Now, it's a very short poem. I think it's something like 60 lines in total. I did read through it. And what it basically is, is Arthur is you know, raised up as this exemplary warrior who takes three boatloads of men with him on this spoil hunt, but only seven of them ever return from it. It's not a huge amount of detail about it, but you know, that's, again, this third element to Arthur is him descending into the underworld. So I think that's a pretty good overview of some of the major elements of Arthur in the early Welsh canon. It's clear that there's things going on there in terms of developments that eventually flower later on in the Arthurian canon, like names of his companions, and his status as a king slowly developing over the course of the canon. So later, by the end of later stories, he's clearly the king of Britain, you know, we all know. So there's a huge amount of stuff I'm missing out there. I've got to say, I think most of this that we're going to talk about was summarising things quite heavily because there's just so much material on King Arthur. Yeah, we thought that this would be less work than the Dragons episodes and then realised, actually, we may be focusing on one character, but we could probably still make five hours if we really tried. If we really tried. <laughs> That's why I'm going to move on then at this point. So you yep. get an understanding that in these earliest poems, he is like a supernatural, mythical entity. So. Let's contrast that with a couple of the actual historical sources that may be contemporary with this time period, the kind of sub-Roman time period of the 5th and 6th centuries. So for most of these accounts, Arthur is either never mentioned, is mentioned in passing, is not mentioned in connection with the famous events which he was claimed later to be involved in, or is mentioned in texts which are of dubious dating. That's the thing I have to say. So. The earliest account that we have, kind of this period, 
is a figure known as St. Gildas wrote a polemic known as On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain. So this is unlike, you know, Geoffrey of Monmouth and Herodotus, as you mentioned, who set themselves up as this is history I'm telling here. He doesn't even have that kind of pretension to him. He's, it's, a, it's a device designed for him to rail against rulers and priests that he thought were unchristian. So like his main, um, like the main source of his anger is the ki- like one of the kings of Northern Wales at the time that he really focuses his anger on. He never mentions Arthur anywhere. He's just not there. But he doesn't mention any of the kings of like Southern England or anything like that. That's never brought into it. He does mention what is going to become a big element of the Arthurian canon, the Battle of Mons Baden. It is mentioned very, very briefly in there, but it does not mention who was the leader of this battle. It just records a British victory over the Saxons. And this is the early days of the Saxon and Anglo, well, the peoples who would be called the Anglo-Saxons, the Jutes, the Angles, and the Saxons, who came over from kind of like southern Denmark, uh, what is now kind of the Netherlands sort of area, northern Germanic folk, who came over and settled in Britain at the end of the Roman period. So the Battle of Montspadden was like a, a temporary victory of the British that was later reversed. So in addition to him, you may have heard of this bloke, Crofty. Is it Bede? Bede? B-E-D-E. The Equestrial History of the English People. I've heard of him, yeah. I wouldn't be able to tell you how it's pronounced either. <laughs> I wouldn't either. Again, this was probably completed in 731, and it covers early church history from the mission of Augustine of Canterbury, all the way kind of up until more contemporary times. And again, mentions the Battle of Mount Baden. Does not mention Arthur. Instead, he le- uh, attributes leadership of the British forces to a figure known as Ambrosius Aurelianus, who does appear in later Arthurian canon. He's frequently in there in various different guises, usually as Arthur's uncle. And I may talk about that a little bit in a minute. What's interesting about this? Gildas is later co-opted into some early versions of the Arthurian story. So there is like a life of St. Gildas that I think has King has Arthur in it. Hmm. And I think this also happens for the earlier poem, poet uh, Taliesin as well. He's like added into some later Welsh accounts. This kind of retrospective historicizing. So the earliest datable reference we have to Arthur from any historical record is what is known as the Historia Britonum. This is an early historical compilation in Latin that likely originates from somewhere around the year 828. It's claimed to be based also on some earlier versions, and it's of very uncertain authorship. It may have been composed by a monk by the name of Neninus. Nennius. Indeed, from like the 10th century onwards, there are versions that have like a preface that attributes it to him. It's pretty certain this is just manufactured after the fact. So in this work, Arthur appears, but not as a king. He appears as an early war leader who works with the other kings of Britain in order to face off with the Saxons. He wins 12 great battles against them, and one of these, the Battle of Mount Baden. So I have the entire section here of that particular chronicle to do with Arthur. It is not long. It's a paragraph. It states the following. At that time, the Saxons grew strong by virtue of their large number and increased power in Britain. Hengist having died, so this is the leader of the Saxon forces, who mentioned Hengist and Horsa, the Toltemic horse gods. However, his son, Okfa, crossed from the northern part of Britain to the kingdom of Kent, and from him are descended the kings of Kent. Then Arthur, along with the kings of Britain, fought against them in those days. But Arthur himself was the military commander. His first battle was at the mouth of the river that is called Glane. His second, third, fourth, and fifth battles were above another river that is called the Douglas, and is in the region of the forest of Celidon. That is Catcoit Celidon. I'm struggling here. The eight battles at the fortress of Gwynon, 
Gwynion, in which Arthur carried the image of the Holy Mary ever virgin on his shoulders. And the pagans were put to flight on that day. And through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary, his mother there was great slaughter among them. The ninth battle was waged in the city of the Legion. So that is Chester, I believe. I have got it written down somewhere in here, so I'll probably correct myself later on. The tenth battle was waged in the banks of the river that is called Trebrute. The eleventh battle was fought in the mountain that is called Agnet. The twelfth battle was on Mount Badham, in which there fell on one day 960 men from one charge by Arthur. And no one struck them down except Arthur himself. And in all the wars he emerged as victor. And while they were being defeated in all the battles, they were seeking assistance from Germany, and their numbers were being augmented many times over without interruption. And they brought over kings from Germany that they may, re that they may reign over them in Britain, right down to the time in which Ida reigned, who was the son of Eboa, who was the first king in Benicia. That's the whole thing. Did I hear that right when you said 9,000 men died and only Arthur killed anyone? 960. 960. <laughs> yeah, even that's a lot, though, we've got to yeah, say. For he one, if it was only Arthur killing that day. I mean, it definitely <laughs> eclipsed the 300 of that bloke earlier. Yeah. He felt, must have felt bad by comparison. Um, Show off. So this account is not considered reliable historically. It has the same problem of Geoffrey of Monmouth's account, which mm. is... It's clearly designed to give like a glorious past to the Britons. So it's where the story of the Britons actually being descended from people escaping from Troy comes from. Brutus of Troy, first king of Britain, that it would later be repeated by Geoffrey of Monmouth. So it's kind of dubious historically. But it is the first mention that we can say datably, this is Arthur by name. And... I don't know about you, Crofty, but that sounds very much in the vein of the earlier literature as well. You know, prominent war leader. Yeah, yeah, not someone who set out to unite the Britons into one country or anything definitely. like the later versions. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's one other source that I think is relevant before I get to Geoffrey of Monmouth, which is in the Annals Cambriae. This is a Welsh history, just means, I think it's just the Annals of the Welsh is what it means. They may date from about the mid-10th century. This is the first mention of the contention of Arthur and a figure known as Medraut, Mordred. So Mordred is kind of the original antagonist, the Arthurian canon Crofty. Hmm. I think you'd agree with me on that one. Yeah, yeah. I think he evolved quite a bit between where you're at and where I'm going to pick up later. I mean, certainly, because here it is literally just a line. I can read you the entire chronicle here as well, because there are two lines. There's a third one on Merlin as well, but I don't have it here, and it's just a passing reference. Um, so the two relevant entries from this, the author of whom is unknown, are for the year 72, which corresponds to AD 516. The Battle of Badham, in which Arthur carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ on his shoulders for three days and three nights, and the Britons were victors. The year 93, which is 537, the Strife of Camlan, in which Arthur and Medraut fell, and there was death in Britain and in Ireland. So the reason I made a point of mentioning those, Crofty, is most of those historical sources appear to be of where Geoffrey of Monmouth then pulled his account from. He reuses much more of these accounts than he does the original Welsh poetry, where he tends to just take things like the names of the battles, the names of Arthur's knights, the name of his wife, Guinevere, and things to that effect. So, Crofty, we come now to kind of the meat of the early Arthurian canon. We've, gone, we've done everything pre galfridian and now we come to Geoffrey of Monmouth. So the history of Geoffrey of Monmouth has loomed large within British history, I think is safe to say. I'm going to get on to a couple of things he's uh, influenced. I think you also have maybe a couple of things that the Arthurian canon as a whole, was influenced later mm. on in like the Tudor era and yeah, yeah, and that. Um, so Geoffrey of Monmouth, to the best of our knowledge, was a cleric who I think was born in the 11th century and who died in the 12th century. There's a lot of details about him that are unknown. His exact birthplace, for example, it's assumed it was Monmouth because he labels himself as Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, in the preface to his history. 
However, it seems likely from what little records we have that he spent most of his life outside of Wales. So there was a record of him having been present in Oxford and that sort of thing. And as I say, he clearly based his text on the Historia Britonum, B to classical history and the Annals Cambrai. So the history he composed literally was still being reported uncritically as late as the 16th century. So the example of this is when Raphael Holinshed wrote his own chronicle of British history, which then went on to influence a lot of Renaissance writers, he basically regurgitated large chunks of Geoffrey's work. And this is how we end up with Shakespeare's tale of King Lear. So King Lear is actually adapted from uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth's history. I was not aware of that. I knew, I knew that was the case because I tried to read it. I tried to read Geoffrey of Monmouth's history not realising that it was like a mythological style history. I just bought it off Amazon when I was like 22 because it was like, yeah, history of Britain. I was like, oh, okay. It's like uh, Asa's Life of Alfred or something like that where it's not as on the level as you'd think it is. Hmm. But, um, yeah, so the difference between this account and some of the previous ones is that in it, Arthur is unambiguously king of the Britons. So there's a couple of things about this account. So I did outline the section on Merlin and Vortigern in our previous episode. Merlin, whilst he is like a dominant part of the later Arthurian canon, he's in there quite significantly, he doesn't directly interact with Arthur at any point in Geoffrey of Monmouth's work. He is involved with prophecy for Vortigern, and he's also involved a lot with Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon. And it's slightly dubious what he is involved with, so what he basically is called in... He's called in for a couple of reasons. He's called in because of a war between the British and the I, I think the Saxons, and he's involved in the construction of Stonehenge, which uh, is used to mark the burial place of fallen warriors. And he's also brought into the narrative for Uther Pendragon, who he bewitches to look like a duke so that he can seduce the duke's wife and sleep with her. Yep, I've... I've yeah. heard that version too. That survives quite a while, that version. Zeusing it up, so to speak. <laughs> um, luckily for them, however, the Duke is then found dead whilst they're still in bed together. And he is able to then marry the Duke's wife, who becomes Arthur's mother. I have seen some later versions where he like marries her by force. And this kind of inadvertently helps lead towards the development of... Mo- of is it Morgan Le Fray later Morgan on? Morgan Le Fay, yeah. Le Fay. But uh, yeah, Merlin is not really that involved at this point. So Arthur succeeds Uther as King of the Britons at age 15. After Uther dies, he dies during a process of making war with the Saxons, and it's claimed he was poisoned. So Arthur immediately contends with the Saxons uh, in the north of Britain, and he drives them north of the Humber. Whilst he's driving them forth and laying siege to their main stronghold, he learns of another Saxon force that's en route from Germany to aid their fellows. And so he retreats back to London to marshal his forces against them. And he defeats them in a great battle. After securing the peace, he marries Guinevere, who is his wife in later accounts and becomes a major figure later on. From this, he in turn then turns his attention to the Picts, the Irish, he conquers Iceland, he invades Norway, he invades Denmark, and pledges to conquer the whole of Europe. (laughs) So he returns Norway to its rightful king, a man by the name of Lof, who is the father of two sons. First one, you may have heard of, Gawain and Mordred. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> After this, he invades Gaul, which he subjugates, and he fights against the fictional tribune of Gaul, this man by the name of Frollo, 
uh, who is explicitly claimed to have been a viceroy of a fictional Roman emperor by the name of Leo. And he ends up, they, like, they come to battle against each other, and rather than there being a full-on battle, so like, Arthur brings huge armies from each of the lands that he's subjected and bribes most of Frollo's forces to join his side, they said decide it via single combat. And what's interesting to me is, when we were reading a lot of the kind of the Greek mythology when we were doing the dragons episode, when you get to figures like Hercules or Zeus, they're presented as such a paragon uh, of valor in battle, they tend to win quite one-sidedly. That is really not the case in this account. So literally, Arthur wins when he gets lucky. So they, they battle, and he narrowly avoids being killed when Frollo manages to strike him full in the face. But I think, I haven't written it down simply what, here what happens, but I think it, like his helmet protects him or something like that. Um, so Frollo gets very close to beating him, and Frollo is like raised up as like a formidable opponent as well. And in the end, he does kill Frollo, and after a campaign that takes nine years, he subdues Gaul. So, yeah, he's doing quite well. He's conquered a lot, significant chunk of Europe at that point. Hmm. More than was actually conquered by the Britons at any point. Yeah, there is um, like a attempts to like connect to like an early like pseudo historical British figure who was supposed to have campaigned in Gaul. Hmm. His name was like Regalius or something like that, and that's like considered a really dubious link. Having subdued all these realms. Arthur calls a great, what's called a great plenary session to celebrate the Pentecost, or as it's labelled in his account, Whitson Day. And this session is held at the City of Legions. So yes, modern Chester, I was right, on the Welsh border. Quite similar to some of the earlier accounts, it has a long list of various kings and rulers and nobles who came to Arthur's court to pay him homage, along with the papal legate. So again, we've got this religious affirmation of Arthur's role. And throughout this account, Arthur is, you know, he's mentioned as having restored the church from the damage done by the Saxons, and he's kind of raised up as this exemplary Christian ruler. So Geoffrey's a bit self-aware as he gives this list. At several points he says, I would give you the full list, but it's, it's very long, and I, yeah. You can see he's aware of how long these lists are as he goes along. It, it's, it's interesting, it kind of feels like, the, like there's a person talking to you there when you listen to it, which you don't often get that feeling when you're reading these accounts, where he's like, yeah, I, I understand this is going to bore the reader. Yeah, the later authors don't do that. They do just <laughs> go on and on. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of where I think the seeds of the court of Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table appear. So the Round Table is not an element at all in this story, and we don't really get like the knights of Arthur's court. But... They do make, like, they stress, like, the level of chival chivalry of his court, and they uh, say that he, like, put out a big call for other rulers, uh, nobles, to come and join his court. However, this session is abruptly ended when, in the middle of the feast, 12 dignitaries arrive carrying a message from an, a person known as Procurator Lucius of Rome. Uh, in my version, I think he's called, like, the version I had. Of this history, I think he was called Emperor Lucius, but he's supposed to be acting on the behalf of this Emperor Leo that I mentioned earlier, demanding the return of Gaul, that he receive the tribute of Britain, which he claims Rome has received since the days of Julius Caesar's conquest, and he also demands that Arthur present himself in Rome for punishment of his crimes. So Arthur rather understandably refuses and basically says, well, you won this tribute via force, therefore I will win the tribute of Rome via force. At which point, one of his followers, who is, I think, Howell, Howell, who is the king of the Amoricans of Brittany, so northwestern France, says, In British history, two previous men have seized the throne of Rome, Bellinus and Constantine. Why not should Arthur follow in their footsteps as the third prophesied man to do so? So Arthur musters a huge army, 183,000 men from his various domains, and marches towards the lands of Transalpine Gaul in southern France now. 
In the meantime, Lucius assembles his own army of some 400,000 men. So Arthur leaves Britain in the trust of his wife and his nephew Mordred <laughs> and journeys to Gaul. Whilst he's sailing, he has a dream of a bear and a great dragon that do battle in the heavens above their ships, and the dragon wins. So Arthur's companions interpret this dragon as symbolising himself and prophesizing his victory. Arthur himself is less certain about this. He doesn't outright say, no, I doom and gloom, I'm actually the bear, but he does say that he's uncertain. Now, there is a big, big digression in the account here where they go off to Spain and kill a giant that has kidnapped the niece of a duke. A bit of a grim story, actually. They arrive too late and the girl's been killed. And... Mm. But they eventually curb stomp the giant to death. <laughs> So it's him, it's his Seneschal Kay, and his cupbearer, Bedivere. I only mention it here because that's kind of like the first big uh, example of his, like, his courtly knights in this tradition being like, significant figures and doing things. And that also carries on a bit during the battles that they have with Lucius and the Romans. So we get back to that. Gawain and Lucius duel over the course of a huge battle between the Romans and the Britons. And Lucius himself is later killed by an unknown hand in the later part of this battle. The Romans are scattered and the Britons are victorious. But as Arthur is burying his dead, he receives word that Mordred has usurped the throne of Britain and crowned himself king, and that he's married Arthur's wife. Now it's interesting to me because there's a long running thread that we're probably going to come on to, which is Guinevere is explicitly identified here as an adulteress and we're going to see a bit more of that in the future quite a bit quite a bit of that so arthur calls off the attack on rome it's like played up as like arthur was inches away from seizing rome and becoming emperor he instead returns to britain where mordred has summoned an army of saxons from northern germany and basically promises them overlordship of northern england and kent so in conclusion, Arthur returns to Britain and engages in a series of battles with Mordred. And in the final of these battles, he duels Mordred and successfully slays him. So Arthur, being mortally wounded, is carried off to the Isle of Avalon so that his wound might be, heal might be healed, and he passes the throne to his cousin Constantine. And that's it, we hear no more of Arthur. He is gone from Geoffrey's account. Is, just to quickly ask, is the battle specified as the Battle of Camelon there? It did, may did well just, be. Just, I, yeah. I have not got it written down here, right. but it could be. So yeah, that's the, the commonly known name for the battle between Arthur and Mordred, or at least in the more modern retellings. So I'm not sure where where it originated. It may well originate there. I don't have it specifically written down. Yeah. So yeah, that's the entirety, really, of Geoffrey's uh, account. So Crofty, I think we can agree from what we both read that Geoffrey of Monmouth's version. It's kind of the bedrock for yeah. Arthur and Cannon going forward. Yeah, I think we can agree on that. But we're missing a few elements. So when people say King Arthur, I think they think of things like Sword and Stone, Knights of the Round Table, Merlin, the Quest for the Holy Grail. None of these elements are in there. There is another element in there, however, that I feel I should mention. So, Crofty, what's the name of Arthur's sword? Excalibur. No. Do we want the QI siren there? Yeah. <laughs> it sort of is. There's a very different Welsh name for it. Um, in Geoffrey's account, it's known as Caliburn. However, I will retroactively not take the points away from you because <laughs> that's getting pretty close to Excalibur. Caliburn. Caliber, Excalibur, yeah. There's also no mention whatsoever of Camelot. It's not mentioned in relation to Arthur's court, which is, as I say, identified with Chester. Um, I think in the Welsh accounts, it is, and in other accounts going forward, it's also mentioned as Caerleon. Yeah, and Caerleon is still a city in Wales. Yeah. Or it's still a town in Wales near Newport. So he, um, yeah. You can kind of see a lot of seeds in there, though, is what I'm trying to get at. So this work would prove to be incredibly popular. 
It's one of the most popular manuscripts of its era. I think there's something like 200 copies that have been found of various versions of it. But the next stage of where this develops is not in Britain, it's not in Wales, although Geoffrey's work seems to have gone back and influenced some of her accounts back in Wales. So we kind of have like this, this circular motion of him then influencing some of the sources that inspired him effectively, or the region that inspired him. The next point is Geoffrey Monmouth's account was transferred to northern France in the 12th century by in an account known as the Roman de Brut. This is a very loose translation by a poet by the name of Wace. And I it's quite loose, so Wace cuts out certain things. So the long section of prophecies in Geoffrey's account attributed to Merlin, he cut out and he said, Yeah, I don't understand this. That's why I cut it out. And he makes a couple of important additions. So I mentioned Arthur's sword being called Caliban. In his work, it clearly seems to be evolving. There are different spellings of different versions, different names. So it's called things like Calibrum, Caliburk, uh, Chalibrun, Calibrun, uh, Escaliburk. It's getting quite close then, you can see. So this kind of sets off something of a mania in northern France. And this is where the Romantic period really of the Arthurian canon appears. Another important element I missed, by the way, was this is also where the Round Table appears. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the Round Table is not inspired by kind of some of the later Arthurian accounts, where it's inspired by none of his nobles being able to agree on where they should be placed at the table. You know, it's a pride, like an allegorical mm -hmm. story. In this version, it's inspired by the Circle of Stonehenge, which Merlin was involved with. So it all ties together. So there are a very large number of Romance era poems that influence this particular uh, tale. The two most important, I feel, are there's a partially lost epic poem called Merlin by the poet Robert de Boron. And this really builds in Merlin's association with the Arthurian canon. It brings it back in. It makes him more explicitly involved with the birth of Arthur. It really brings in Merlin's association with the Holy Grail. And it is the first account of the sword in the stone, where after Uther Pendragon's death, the rightful king of Britain is determined by who can draw a sword from an anvil that appears within the grounds of a church on Christmas Eve. And obviously Arthur is the one who draws the sword. The other prominent author who really influenced this thought, and that kind of gets us almost to your part of it, Crofty, is, is it Crichton de Trois, Trois, who was a poet in the, he's in the 12th century as well, 12th or 13th century, and he wrote a number of poems that were influential in the development of the Arthurian canon. The two most influential of these are Lancelot of the Cart, it's the first ever mention of Lancelot, and Percival, the story of the Grail. I would like to read these to you in length, but they're both very, very long, so the best I can manage here, unfortunately, is a summary of the two poems. So, the story of Lancelot and the Cart, this is, as I say, it, it's basically a love story between Lancelot and Guinevere. Arthur's wife. So how it opens is that Guinevere has been abducted by a villain by the name of Malagant. Uh, yes, I, I have the same name written down for later on. Yeah. Malagant, I think. So we're almost meeting in the middle here, basically. Who is the king of the nearby kingdom of Gore? And the whole story just is a deep examination of Lancelot's trial, like trials in rescuing. Guinevere, and his struggle to both balance the fact that he is you know, a loyal warrior of Arthur with the fact that he's a lover of this person. And it's explicitly adultery as well. This is kind of one of the elements that gets almost like bolderized uh, later on, however that's pronounced, where obviously the adultery elements get cut back on with each revision. Mm. Um, in this, it's like, no, it's like... It's adultery, and it's consummated at the end, and they live happily ever after. 
So you're can... rewarded for being a bad person. Yeah. Well, well bad in terms of like the Christian yeah. uh, the chronicles who wrote these accounts. And the kind of nuts and bolts of this story is Lancelot has been so eager to sue this abducted queen, he keeps running out each of his horses to death and is forced, uh, after using up horses that Gawain uh, lends to him, he wears out all his horses and encounters a cart-driving dwarf who says, yeah, you can ride on my cart with me. So he hesitates to do so because it's a dishonorable form of transport for a knight. And he is basically mocked by the locals for having reduced himself to such a lowly stature. So yeah, basically he goes, it's, he goes through a long series of encounters with more beautiful women and knights. And eventually he and Gawain split up ways to come more ground. And after a long series of these trials, he successfully frees uh, Gawain from Meleg... Uh, get that wrong every time. Frees Gawain. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Freeze Guinevere. It's a very different from story. Yeah, there, yeah. I've heard that story. Anyway, basically, she's cold towards him because he hesitated to enter the cart, so he's immodest. And eventually, they, Lancelot leaves with Gawain and they get drawn back in. It's a long and complicated story. Eventually, Lancelot breaks into her tower and they spend a passionate night together. However, in the process of breaking into the tower, he injures his hand and leaves blood on her sheets. As a result, Guinevere is not uh, accused of committing adultery with Lancelot, but with the only other injured knight at the time of the round table, which is Kay. So, after her being kind of reduced to this dishonour by Malagant, Lancelot challenges Malagant to a fight to defend her honour, and yeah, there's a whole silent plot about him being tricked by another dwarf and imprisoned, but eventually the fight happens. Guinevere says, to prove your love, you must throw this fight, basically. And then halfway through, she changes her mind. Eventually he wins, and yeah, they like tepidly embrace, because they're in public and it's still adultery. Mm. The other story is Percival. So Percival opens with Percival, who is a young boy who has been raised away from civilization in the forest of Wales by his mother. And out riding one day, he encounters a group of knights and decides, I want to be a knight. So he ignores his mother's objections and he goes to King Arthur's court. Whilst there, Sir Kay, Arthur's seneschal, mocks him, and slaps a girl who predicts, great, uh, predicts greatness for Percival. However, Percival then amazes everybody, who, by then killing a bandit knight who has been troubling King Arthur, and after that he sets off on an adventure. So he trains under an experienced knight by the name of Gornamant, and then falls in love with and rescues the knight's niece. After this, he captures her abductors and sends them to King Arthur's court, where they proclaim his vow of revenge on Sir Kay for mocking him. Percival then checks in on his mother, and during the course of his journey, he comes across a figure known as the Fisher King. So probably this is probably another figure that we're all a little bit familiar with. Mm. This is the Fisher King, who is kind of depicted as like a, almost like a crippled king who's Strength is linked to the land he rules. Finds him fishing on a boat in the river, and this king invites him to stay at his castle. Now, I think in different versions of this myth, there's like there are effectively two fisher kings, where there is the king who's out fishing, and then there is a more grievously wounded king back in the castle who is the father of the other king. Whilst Percival is at the castle, he witnesses a strange procession of magnificent objects being carried from one chamber to another including an elaborately decorated grail. This is not labelled as the Holy Grail in this account. This is just called a Golden Grail. Having been taught not to speak out by his mentor, Percival remains silent through the whole procession. He wakes up the next morning alone and re resumes his journey. 
As he goes, he meets with another girl who admonishes him for not asking about the grail because it turns out this could have healed the wounded kin. I'm not sure what the moral particularly is there. <laughs> yeah, so the wounded king had the grail at that point. I'm not 100% sure. It's difficult to tell. Because the grail is like... What's it called when the um, like the Christian ceremony where you have like the, uh, the Eucharist? Where you have like the wafer oh, and the wine? The, the blood and the body of Christ. Yeah, the blood and the body of Christ. Yeah. I'm not sure of the specific name. So. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be linked with that, where the grail contains one of those wafers. Hmm. And... Um, yeah, the problem with this, the real problem, though, with this story is it's incomplete. It was incredibly popular. Four other writers tried to finish it, but the original version is incomplete. In fact, the original version of Lan the Lancelot story I mentioned is also you know, not particularly complete either. And I think another author probably finished it for Crichton. So, uh, after this... Percival contends with and captures another knight. Again, sends him to King Arthur's court to say the same message. I want my revenge on Kai for taunting me. King Arthur then decides to set out and find Percival and attempts to convince him to join the court. However, Percival kind of inadvertently challenges Sir Kay to a fight where he exacts his revenge. He breaks Sir Kai's arm. At which point, Percival agrees to join the court. Then another woman enters and admonishes him for once again failing to ask the Fisher King about the Grail. And that's where it ends. Hmm. It's a strange one. Yeah. You see, well, you see, it's, it's clearly incomplete. Yeah. There is like another story with Gawain as the protagonist that kind of takes off from there at that point. That again is incomplete. Hmm. So, yeah. It's incomplete, but these two, along with the Merlin poem that I mentioned before, combine together into much of the kind of, like, they add to Geoffrey of Monmouth's core, and this is kind of the common package then of the Arthurian myth going forward. I think you'd agree, Crofty. Yeah, yeah. So the theme I find, and that many other authors have commented on running through this, is Arthur goes from being, like, this powerful warrior, and the tales are all about him, to very much being a background character. The focus moves to his knights and his court around him. And there's this common element that comes in of Arthur being presented as a cuckold, where, you know, particularly with Lancelot, it's clear that his wife is in love with another mm. man. And in various versions, this is consummated. In some versions, he finds out about it and reacts very weakly. There's, like, stories where he's at a feast and he gets tired and has to go to bed early. So... Arthur becomes a much more frail figure in these in this romance tradition. It's less about the very British best warrior ever to, you know, there's more of a move towards the, the romance of Lancelot and Guinevere. So I come now to the last thing which I have, which until now we've had all these individual threads. There's a whole bunch of other romance poetry that I haven't really gone into just out of time and sheer volume of many of these stories. What codifies all these elements together is what's known as the Lancelot Grail cycle or the Vulgate cycle. So this is an early 13th century literary cycle and it's here where we really move away from the verse poetry of the earlier romance stories to just having prose stories. And what this effectively is, is it combines the Merlin poem, it combines the Lancelot uh, cycle, and it also includes and expands on the search for the grail uh, that we had earlier with Percival. And it also adds elements in like Galahad, who is Lancelot's son, into this grail quest. Now, this is a very long body of literature, so I haven't been able to read through the whole thing myself for it. I've read basically a summary for it. So it consists of you know, four or five major parts. The first of these appears to be completely new and unique to the cycle, which is the history of the Holy Grail. And this basically tells the simple story of uh, Joseph of Arimathea and his son Josephus, who bring the Holy Grail because it's connected to Christ, they bring it, that's how it's brought to Britain. And it's actually uh, derived 
from a different poem by Robert de Baron, who's the Merlin poem author, uh, called Joseph. And this is really where we see the religious elements of this cycle ramped up. The next version is basically just a conversion of Robert Duran's poem of Merlin into what's called the Prose Merlin, which again includes those elements we met before. We then get what's called the Merlin proper afterwards. So this brings Merlin in from the kind of earlier poem and adds him into much more of Arthur's early deeds and associates him much more with Gawain. So, you know, when we went through Geoffrey of Monmouth's account, Merlin just kind of disappears after Arthur's birth. This explicitly puts him back in as part of their struggle against the Saxons, um, against the Romans. Interestingly, in this version, I think this is one of the early versions where we see the Lady of the Lake. So Merlin actually disappears from the plot due to the fact that he essentially tries to win the hand of the Lady of the Lake, who basically says, I will give you my love if you give me all your secrets in return. So the Lady of the Lake's a curious figure in Arthurian canon. Her role early on is she appears basically as the foster parent of Lancelot, where I think in the Lancelot of the Cart, he's mentioned as being like raised on an island by a fairy queen, and she has become the Lady of the Lake later on. In early versions, she's also associated with Morgan Le Frey, where basically she is Morgan Le Frey. Morgan Le Frey is a great healer. It's her who tends to Arthur at Avalon, etc. And Morgan kind of evolves into a different figure later on and becomes much more antagonistic. And what you can see is a lot of clerics kind of put their ideas about paganism onto her. And she becomes the embodiment of the pagan, almost the fertility goddess, the trickster, mag like magician and witch. And it's interesting to see how she develops as a result. But moving on from that, after kind of adding Merlin back in, we then get what's called the prose Lancelot. This is easily the biggest part of the entire cycle, and it follows the adventures of Lancelot and the other knights of the Round Table. And this is just a much larger expansion of the Lancelot of the Cart, and it again turns the love between him and Guinevere into a more courtly love. It sprinkles in the adventures of Gawain, uh, is it Yvain, Owain? Uh, is one of the other major knights who also appears in uh, Crichton de Troy's earlier poems as well. And that's, that's actually considered his masterpiece, but we won't go into it today. And it kind of builds that into the, Vul the uh, Vulgate version of the quest for the Holy Grail. And unlike the Percival version of it, it has multiple knights contending and trying to find the Grail. It has Percival, it has a figure known as Bors, who is like the last survivor who relates the account at the end in almost a kind of Ulysses sort of role. Interestingly here, Galahad, which is Lancelot's son, he replaces both Lancelot and Percival as the chosen hero who finds the grail, essentially. The final element then to the Vulgate is the death of King Arthur. This follows very closely from Geoffrey of Monmouth's account. So again, he uh, dies at the hand of his of Mordred. In this account, and I think in various others, Mordred kind of goes between being Arthur's nephew or his illegitimate son. What's interesting as well is the ruin of Arthur's, Arthur's kingdom here is presented as the result of Lancelot and Guinevere's affair. The kingdom's torn apart as a result of their actions. And in fact, Lancelot's kind of portrayed as a much more villainous figure here. So it's like stated, you know, he was Arthur's former prime knight who has betrayed him, who slays all of his nephews. I think what confuses things a little bit is that Mordred is like the only nephew who isn't killed, but he's also called an illegitimate son elsewhere. So there's a little bit of confusion in these accounts. Yeah, so that's... A quick kind of overview and summary of the Vulgate Lancelot. It kind of melds together all these individual threads and becomes the real genesis. I know we've said that a whole bunch before for Jeff, uh, Jeffrey of Monmouth setting the bedrock, but this is the whole 
the overall synthesis that brings in all the elements together at the earliest point, as far mm. as I can tell. Yeah. Yeah. And then the final thing I have to say, Crofty, um, is this version then got kind of re-edited. And I believe it's what's called the... Is it the pulse, the post vulgate or that? Yeah. Basically, it's a much shorter version that cuts out a lot of the adulterous elements with Lancelot. Lancelot's section is almost completely cut entirely to get rid of most of that. Yeah, and it's just a, a much more cut down version. And it, the, I think the reason why these elements were changed is because it was actually written by like a group. Um, known as the Cistercian Order. And they were an order that basically condemned anything that was not the spiritual life. So you can see, you know, Lancelot now, it's a courtly love story rather than the adulterous love story. Mm. Um, it kind of like sprinkles in other elements and expands other. It brings in the, like parts of the prose Tristan. So Tristan and Isolde which in turn influenced Lance, Lancelot Grail. So, yeah, you can see there's a whole bunch of complicated threads being pulled together. So, yeah. So that's kind of a summary of development within the Romantic era of the Arthurian canon. Over the next two centuries, we see kind of further development and we get to what's really, honestly, like the culmination, initially at least, of this series of development of the Arthurian law. And by the time we reach the 15th century, we get to a piece of work that combines both kind of the older British stories and the kind of romantic French reinterpretation. And this, of course, is the work of Thomas Mallory. So, Crofty, I believe this is where you begin. Yes, um, so the major focus of my section is Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur, um, an English author who presented this as an actual historical chronicle. So he, his writing style was basically designed to be the same as the historical chronicles of the time, which makes it very difficult to read <laughs> as a modern reader. It's 700 pages, which is some you know n smaller than the later Game of Thrones novels, and yet it's still much more difficult to get through. Yeah, the, the sort of thing that Robert Jordan would crank out in two weeks, basically. Yeah, and that everybody would get a headache reading. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yes, it it tries to draw together a lot of threads from Geoffrey of Monmouth from the original Romance era versions and the Vulgate cycle. So there's some things that seem to be a bit self-contradictory. There's some bits where there's several versions of certain events and he's found a way to include all the versions of this event, there's a lot of points where someone has to draw a sword and has to be worthy of drawing this sword that no one else can draw. You seem to really, really like that sort of theme. Yeah, I think there's a version, uh, one of the swords we where uh, Gawain also has to do the sword and the stone bit as well. Yeah, yeah. Gawain fails in this version. Ah. He's not worthy. <laughs> and we'll get to why later on, because Gawain is quite instrumental towards the end. So it's spread over, depending on which edition, it's spread over either 21 very short books or seven quite long books, depending on whether it's the original Maori version that was lost for some time or the William Caxton publication, which was first the first one published, but was technically an edit, edit to the original manuscript. So it was finished in, I believe, 1479, um, to be published in 1485. Um, which will become important when I discuss the actual historical context of it. It begins in a very similar way to Geoffrey of Monmouth in that it begins with, as Charles was saying, King Uther using Merlin to cast an illusion on him to make him appear as the King of Cornwall, um, wherein he then sneaks into the King of Cornwall's castle and sleeps with the Lady Igraine, or Ingrain. Um, though in this version, Uther is both at war with the King of Cornwall and in love with Igraine. And so he kind of kills two birds with one stone in a way, in that he has Merlin set a trap for the King of Cornwall, luring him out of his castle that's under siege. And so the King of Cornwall is actually being killed in battle as King Uther <laughs> is lying with Queen Ingrain. So it's a little bit more villainous, really, then, from Uther, because 
the early account that I had was like, you know, oh, yeah, the Duke Commors is vassal and he really loves his wife, so he's going to trick him. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not good, yeah. but it's not as openly murderous. Yeah, this one, Uther's not a sympathetic character <laughs> in this. But Ingrain does fall in love with him and returns to London with him, which is where Uther's court is in this version. And not long after, she reveals that she's pregnant. Presumably, she thinks, by her husband, the deceased King of Cornwall. But she explains that she doesn't understand how he could have come to her in the night while he was you know, several miles away getting killed. Yeah, getting um, deaded. At which point, Uther explains what he did. And Ingrain's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, great. So this, this son here is actually yours. It's a legitimate child now. <laughs> Wonderful. It all worked out great for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a strange one there. And Merlin was very complicit in it. Um, so Merlin does have quite a large role from this point onwards until um, close to the start of the Lancelot section of the books, um, which I'm going to focus on to start with once I've got the whole birth of Arthur out of the way. So Arthur is born nine months later, as children tend to be. And Merlin says that says to Uther that what Uther has to do is give the child to Merlin. Merlin will take it to one of his dukes, have it nursed by the Duchess, who also has another son of, I think, about a year older or so. I think it was... Sir U- Sir Urien's the Duke, and raised as this Duke's son. Um, Uther doesn't understand, but Merlin managed to get the King of Cornwall killed for him and managed to get Ingrain married to him, so he trusts Merlin at this point and goes along with it. About 15 years later, so Arthur's a teenager at this point, Uther um, dies of an illness. No foul play suggests or anything, just natural causes. And apparently childless, the succession is called into question. At this this point, Merlin then sets up the sword in the stone so as to prove who's worthy of being king. There's, there's no mention of any historical precedent as this being a reason for why someone's worthy of being king, but he sets this up in London and dukes from all over the land come to London uh, to determine where they're worthy. And that's when Arthur attempts to draw the sword in the stone against the wishes of his ado- adoptive father. At night, he draws a sword and stone and goes, oh, I'm rightful king then. He puts it back. He tells his father, shows his father that he can draw and replace the stone, the sword and stone at will. And they get all of the dukes present to congregate at the stone. And everyone tries it. We've observed by the Archbishop of Canterbury in order to ensure that this is a fair trial. And the only person who can draw it is Arthur. However, like I say, there's no historical precedent as to why this should be reason for succession, and it's only Merlin's word that this is proof that he's worthy. And so 11 of the other dukes, or usually referred to as kings, kings of a smaller country within Britain, decide we're not taking this, we're not going to allow this this boy to be deemed king of all, all of Britain, mm-hmm. and they declare war. The named ones of these Kings include King Lot of Orkney, um, who I believe you mentioned as King Loth earlier on, um, King Rience, who will come up later on, King Pelinor, who will come up later on as well. So Arthur, newly crowned king, whose crown is being disputed, goes to war against pretty bad odds. Um, Sir Kay is there as a seneschal again. Sir Uriens is part of, part of his court as well, and one of his advisors. And Merlin is advising him at this point as well. Merlin's advice is to go to Gaul and send for King Ban and King Bors of two smaller kingdoms within Gaul, who are currently engage- engaged in a war against um, the King King Claudas, also of Gaul, mm. um, and basically offer, if you aid me in defeating these other kings and uniting Britain, I'll aid you in getting rid of King Claudas. And so Ban and Bors agree with this, and they travel to England and engage in war with these 11 kings. And this is where the style of the historical chronicle becomes very obvious, because there's a chapter on the first battle, and then the next chapter is yet of the same battle, 
and then yet more of the same battle <laughs> and yet more of the same battle and how it was ended by Merlin. Yeah. And a lot of it is simply X fought against Y and struck him down, repeat ad nauseum. And towards the end of this battle, the 11 kings are still alive. Thousands have been killed in this battle at this point. And Merlin has foreseen that Saracens are going to attack the Northern lands and the 11 kings will soon be have other problems to worry about. And so Arthur can at this point retreat and let the Saracens weaken them. And Merlin also knows of other things that will happen in the future relating to these kings and why they need to be alive and why Arthur can then defeat them later on. See, the thing about Merlin in this, the, the general opinion of him relative to King Arthur, Charles, what would you say? What would you say Merlin is to King Arthur within his court? How would you describe him? His magician, his seer, his advisor. There we go. Yeah. The word advisor is the word that does tend to get used for Merlin. And while, well, I suppose technically he was employed as an advisor, in terms of what his role is in the story and what he does, his advice is generally not the best. <laughs> <laughs> see, he, he has the power of perfect foresight. He can see every aspect of the future. He knows everything. He at one point does reference to having seen his own death. And yeah, example, this is also in, um, I mentioned earlier, in the, when he was uh, trying to seduce the Lady of the Lake, he actually has a vision saying, no, it's going to go bad for you if you try and do this, <laughs> but the visions are always true. Yeah. So he has to go along with it. Yeah, that, and that has summed him up quite well. Rather than seeing the future and using this in order to avoid the bad events, in order to aid Arthur to warn him, or just to not do the dumb thing himself, which does come up later on. Merlin's role as a prophet is more, it's more in the Greek tradition and similar to Tiresias or the Oracle at Delphi, where his role is to ensure that the future happens as he sees it, be it by giving a self-fulfilling prophecy or by actively manipulating events in order to make sure that they, they play out as he's seen it or just withholding the full prophecy. So Merlin's poor advice or advice making the future play out in that way obviously starts with when he tells Uther to give up Arthur and cause all these events which cause, one, the succession to be questioned when obviously if Arthur had just been left to be raised by Uther, no one would have questioned it and then which causes a war as well over it. And so after the end of this war, in fact, um, Duke Uriens does actually call out Merlin for this calling him a witch and saying that it is entirely his fault, that the war is entirely his fault. So the argument being like, if you didn't give this prophecy, which had to be absolutely fulfilled in that way, yeah, you're the one making up prophecy, essentially. Exactly, exactly. And this sort of theme with Merlin give, giving incomplete prophecies or prophecies that he can then influence carries on quite a while. So after this battle and a peace, for a while, Arthur does travel to go and, to Gaul to aid King King Ban and King Bors against Claudas. That's a relatively uneventful war. Um, you know, deals with King Claudas in short order. Um, in travelling there, though, this is one of the times where Merlin's advice was, at the time, quite good, but also did then lead to things getting worse in the future. Because upon while travelling to Gaul, Arthur passes through the land of Cameliard and rescues King Leo de Grants, who happens to be the father of a woman by the name of Guinevere. Ah. This is the first point in which Arthur meets Guinevere, and though he doesn't marry until much later, at this point it can be considered as a good thing that, through Merlin's interferences, he met his wife, even if it doesn't necessarily end well for him later on. Following that, he deals with King Claudas, returns to London. Um, later on, he does move his court to Camelot, and the text in this case explicitly states Camelot, which is at Winchester. Um, so for the most part, as I say, um, Sir Thomas Mallory seems to be trying to present this as an actual historical chronicle. So he does use as many real names as possible. For example, the final battle later on is specified to be at Salisbury Plain, um, which also then fits with the, perceived, the believed location of the Lake of Avalon at Glastonbury Tor. Um, yeah. Quite easy to get a wounded man there quickly enough. 
this thing, the next dubious thing that Merlin, Merlin did, well, Merlin proved, proved in inverted commas, mm. that Arthur was the rightful king. He never didn't actually tell Arthur of his parentage at this point. So Arthur doesn't know he's the son of King Uther. And later on, the wife of King Lot of Orkney, um, who was the was the daughter of Queen Ingrain by the King of Cornwall previously, visits Camelot for diplomatic reasons. We're still pre-Guinevere here, I will specify. The wife of King Lot, Arthur's half-sister, Arthur sleeps with her. Not knowing that he is he is her half brother, and this union produces a child. Uh, by am, I the... gonna, am I going to guess <laughs> who this child is? By the name of Mordred. <laughs> yes. So in this version, it combines both the version where Mordred is Arthur's nephew and the version where Mordred is Arthur's son. That might actually make sense of some of the legends that I was looking at as well now, because mm. I was kind of missing that thread. Yeah, th- this part makes it very explicit. And then after the fact, um, has Merlin tell Arthur that he has sinned. He tells Arthur that that was your half-sister. God kind of frowns upon that. So he tells Arthur that you've, you've sinned, and as punishment for this, it's God's will that your son will kill you. Strangely enough, though, she goes back to Orkney, and Arthur doesn't do anything about it at this point. Yeah, He's like, he, he knows full well where his half-sister is and the mother of his child is, knowing full well that the child in question will kill him, having already seen that Merlin's prophecies are accurate. And doesn't think now's maybe the time to act. Yeah, it's, I, mean, uh, I don't know, maybe it's one of those where I know that this is, this is me trying to read the mind of a guy in the 15th century who is adapting centuries worth of previous things, but maybe yeah. the idea is more, well, I've already committed one sin, you know, maybe I should accept my fate rather than... You'd say that, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I've no. got completely the wrong I'm idea. Like, in In this same conversation... By saying that the, his death is punishment, Merlin does also say that Arthur will die a worshipful death. So he is implying that Arthur is being a hero later on. And also mentions that he himself will die a shameful death. Um, so at this point, Merlin knows what's going to happen to him later on and is still doing nothing to stop it. So Merlin's next bit of advice, while he's already mentioned that it's Arthur's son who will kill him, and so Arthur knows who the mother of his son is and could easily do something about it. He says that the person who will kill him will be born on May Day. And so Mar- um, Arthur has all of the children who were born on May Day rounded up, put on a ship, and brought to Camelot to be executed. Wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like he, he knows exactly which child he needs, but he still rounds up all of them. And this is again... Merlin setting an event, in, setting an emotional self-fulfilling prophecy in that by Arthur putting all these children on the ship, the ship then gets destroyed in a storm. Mordred is one of the survivors. He is adopted by a family who find, finds him and he only comes to Arthur's court at about 15 years old. Somehow knowing his name's Mordred and knowing who his parents are, but no one really thinking to maybe tell Arthur. Well, he did go away with his, with his mother, didn't he? So presumably she could have It's him. not really specified. Oh, okay. It's specified that the children were rounded up and put on a boat to be killed at Camelot and that then the boat was wrecked and that he was adopted by a family who found him. So again, dubious advice from Merlin. Uh, he does have some good advice. Like I say, calling on King Ban and King Bors, which then also gives him more eyes both to fight the Eleven Kings and later on when he attacks Rome, having more allies. Um, And also his advice of let the Eleven Kings worry about the Saxons, Saxons, not Saxons, the Saracens for now. Um, It will weaken them and that there will be a chance for you to defeat them later. And that does come to pass, as Merlin said it, and we'll get to that in a while. But some of those bits of advice do have bad implications later for example king ban still being an ally later on gives lancelot somewhere to flee to which causes further problems with lancelot later on the only real bit of advice that merlin does give that 
can be seen as actually trying to help Arthur and not trying to make fate work out as he's seen it was when when Arthur gets Excalibur. Because the Sword in the Stone and Excalibur are separate swords yeah. at this point. The Sword in the Stone, it is at one point referred to as Excalibur, but later on it's then not. I think it's an yeah. issue with translating from Old English into Modern English. I did see a version um, where the initial sword that he uses at the Sword in the Stone is Caliborn, and yeah. then the Lady of the Lake later gives him Excalibur after Caliborn is broken. Yeah, that's it. In this case... Again, the initial sword is broken, so that might be it. It might be Caliban, um, and that's where there was the mistake referring to it as Excalibur, because mm-hmm. it's a, the magical sword that sheds light when drawn and all that. Yeah, Excaliborn. Yeah. The former Caliban, yeah. Yeah. So when traveling with Merlin at one point, Arthur meets King Pelinor, one of the 11 kings who I mentioned earlier on, of a kingdom in Wales, um, who in this version is the father of Sir Percival. So Sir Percival starts off as noble-born rather than being a low-born who becomes a knight. Sir Percival is very much sidelined in this. He there's some positive aspects to him, but he does and he doesn't one of the few who doesn't really do anything horrible. But he's quite sidelined from the story in favour of Galahad. Um, but that's a matter for later. So Arthur meets Pelinor, having only been an uneasy peace with him and still wanting to stop him from being the king of all Britain, tries to kill him. And he breaks Arthur's sword, and he has Arthur at his mercy, and right when he's about to deliver the killing blow, Merlin puts him to sleep. <laughs> and Merlin refuses to kill him, even though Arthur wishes to, again because he's needed for parts of the future that Merlin's seen. And when Arthur needs a new sword, and he's after this, Merlin takes him to the Lake of Avalon, and the Lady of the Lake aspect plays out, as everybody knows, the hand comes out of the hand comes out of the lake holding the sword, which Arthur takes. And Merlin ask, asks Arthur, upon te- when he takes Excalibur, which is more important, the sword or the scabbard? Arthur, being a warrior, responds, the sword. But Merlin responds with, and I quote, Ye are more unwise, said Merlin, for the scabbard is worth ten of the swords. For while ye have the scabbard upon you, ye shall never lose no blood, be ye never so sore wounded. Therefore keep well the scabbard always with you. And at least twice later on in the story, he repeats this advice. He repeats it at some point over the next few chapters. And then his final conversation with Arthur before he leaves Camelot for good is to once again implore him, never give up the scabbard. The scabbard is the important part here. The scabbard will always protect you. And he obviously knows that this is futile. He's seen how the future will play out and he's set every event in motion that he needs to. So it's the one time where he is actually giving true advice to Arthur as Arthur's friend and advisor, even though he knows full well that Arthur won't, won't listen to him or that Arthur will make a mistake later on. Would you, say that that's, would you say that's like a contradiction or would you say it's like a development of the character where as he befriends Arthur, he's starting to fight against his pre-described role to save his friend? Yeah, I, I would think that it is a bit of character growth there it's he's seeing arthur as a friend because like i say he tells arthur this advice three times it's the last thing he says to him before he goes to his death and so i i do think that he is there merlin just trying to break out of this fate that he's seen and that he's been determined to be a part of and an enabler of this future so the end of merlin's story um we've done that in book three or four um, he does pop up in book two that I'm going to be discussing in a minute, um, but I'll end Merlin's story and then go back. Uh, the end of Merlin's story, similar to what you said about him falling in love with the Lady of the Lake. In this case, it's not the Lady of the Lake herself. It's a sorceress called Nimue, who has appeared in other works, is later on renamed Vivian, and who does come up in modern fiction as well. So he falls in love with this Nimue, and when she asks him to leave Camelot with her, he, do- he does. Um, like I say he gives Arthur his final advice of do not give up the scabbard before leaving Camelot. He, as he travels with Nimue, he visits King Ban, um, he visits the mother of Lancelot, and he predicts the great deeds of both Lancelot and Galahad to their mother, and well, to Lancelot's mother, Galahad's grandmother. 
and he teaches Nimue his magics as he travels. She doesn't trust him, despite traveling with him, and you know she agreed to travel with him and be his lover, but she apparently doesn't trust him. She warns him that she will kill him if he ever enchants her. He never does. Um, and at the end of the chapter, um, it reads, and I'll quote again, And always Merlin lay about the lady to have her maidenhood, and she was ever passing wary of him, and fain would have been delivered of him, for she was afeard of him because he was the devil's son. Yeah, um, this is, and I don't think we mentioned this earlier, was uh, if you look at Jeffrey Monmouth's account, he is explicitly like an in- like the son of an incubus, yeah. is uh, Merlin, so that makes sense. Yeah, and so again, he's very much specified to be the son of a devil. Um, I mean, I think in the, the Merlin poem that I mentioned earlier, he is like, it's like this backstory where a, a bunch of devils are plotting to make him the Antichrist and it doesn't work, basically. Yeah. And so instead he chooses to become Arthur's advisor and actually take the side of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the chapter ends with, and so on a time it happened that Merlin showed to her in a rock whereas was a great wonder, and wrought by enchantment, that went under a great stone. And so by her subtle working, she made Merlin go under that stone, to let her wit of the marvels there. But she wrought so there for him, that he came never out of the stone, for all the craft he could do. And so she departed and left Merlin. And that's how Merlin dies in this version. Hmm. And similar ver- variants of that pop up in later versions as well yeah the, the earlier lady of the lake version is very similar as well except i don't think merlin ever dies in that version he's just trapped and the lady in the lake comes and visits him occasionally yeah I, I think in this version he does he does essentially die trapped in the stone whereas later on um there's versions where he's trapped in a tree and is just stuck there for all time so this version of merlin so part of it could say perhaps influenced by the fact that the church is very much taking suffer not the witch to live quite seriously from the from the 15th century. Um, and so while he, he can't be removed entirely from the narrative because he's become such a prominent part of it. Yeah, he's the fan he, favourite. Yeah, he kind of has to have his role very much diminished and made much more ambiguous. So as you can say, right, he's a devil child, he's a witch. We can't see him as the good guy. And I think that is also where um, the idea of using the more Greek myth- Greek mythology kind of servant of fate aspect comes from as well. They had to very much make him so that he wasn't truly supporting Arthur. Yeah. Even if he did redeem himself a bit with trying to change fate by telling him to um, keep the scabbard. Yeah. We also see kind of um, an evolution kind of Lady of the Lake as well where things that were attributed to her in previous versions of the myth are now being split off into multiple figures. And I think there is actually an early version, I don't remember which version this was, where there are actually like nine ladies of the lake or something. And it's clearly a reference to a Roman account like of uh, goddesses on an island. I think it's Pomponius Mel, I mentioned this in the Druids video. Hmm. Um, it's clearly hearkening back to his depiction of like these virgin goddesses. Like living off the coast of Gaul, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the these aspects of Merlin are covered between like chapters, w- books one and four, I believe. Um, with Merlin ending at that point, so I'm going to skip back to book two because this one's very much a self-contained story, but it sets up a lot of elements that pop up in the Grail quest later on. And there is an unexpected cameo from a certain biblical artifact that's not the Grail. You might not be expecting. So the second book is the tale of Sir Balin, who didn't really seem to survive into a lot of the modern fiction versions. I'd not really heard of him before researching this version. Yeah, there's a few of those because where you see me like, I've never heard of this guy. Yeah. So he first shows up, he's a prisoner of King Arthur. He killed Arthur's cousin um, and was kept in prison for half a year. But Arthur then forgave him, showed mercy and forgiveness, good Christian qualities. And released him, and after he proved himself, became one of Arthur's knights. Um, At this time, a woman comes to court wearing a sword that she claims can only be drawn by a true and virtuous knight. Oh, this is sounding familiar. Yeah. All of the knights, including Arthur himself, who has already proven that he's worthy of these magical swords, fail, until Balin, who nobody expected because of that murder he committed to be able to draw the sword, um, asks to try, and he successfully takes the sword. 
the lady asks that he return it, and he refuses. And so the damsel warns that he's cursed, and will kill his greatest friend and bring his own destruction. Shortly after that, the Lady of the Lake herself does show up in mm. Arthur's court. I'm not sure whether this is another mistranslation of a separate figure um, when translating it from old to modern English. But the Lady of the Lake demands the favour that Arthur promised her as payment for Excalibur. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah. Um, this favour she demands is that he give her Balin's head, because Balin killed her brother. Yeah, this is in, this is in the older versions as yeah. well. This is in the romance version. Yeah. Um, so Balin, rather angry about this, just straight up beheads her right in Arthur's court. <laughs> Which, um, Oof, yeah. yeah, he justifies it by claiming that she'd killed his mother. There's n that's never elaborated on, just, it's okay, she killed my mother. It's a pattern of behaviour, though, like at this point. Like, yeah, you've already killed one guy, you now refuse to give someone their property back, and then you just murdered someone else. I'm definitely going to believe you when you say they killed your mother. Oh, it gets worse. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Balin has some anger issues to work through. And yeah, so Arthur doesn't believe him, and even so, he killed an unarmed lady in front of the king, and that's unforgivable. Basically the devil. Yeah, Balin flees. Another knight, Sir Lancior, not to be confused with Sir Lancelot, pursues him, partly out of jealousy that he couldn't draw the sword himself, because at this point he's still believing that the sword is for a true and virtuous knight. Though the jealousy then kind of proves that he's not the true and virtuous knight anyway. Yeah. Sir Balin kills him in battle, and his wife or his lover, the Lady Cologne, upon finding the body, don't know why she was following them, but upon finding mm. the body, she throws herself on Sir Lancior's sword. Now, King Mark of Cornwall finds them and insists that a tomb is built for the two of them. King Mark, I'll not be going into the stories he's involved with, but he is the husband of Isolde, who uh, does come yeah. up later. Because, uh, yeah, Tristan and Isolde is another one of the kind of getting away with adultery stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's one that I'm not going to go too much into because it's like four books long yeah. and it adds nothing. Really, to the main legend, it works as a sort of parallel story. Mm -hmm. um, but for those interested, it's King Mark, husband of his old, who shows up and insists that these two be properly buried and insists that Balin stay and bury these two. Merlin shows up at this point, prophesying to King Mark that on this site, Lancelot and Tristram will do battle. And on the tomb, he writes this fact for some reason. Again, it's not really explained. Merlin is just going around subtly influencing people like he does. Mm -hmm. He refuses to tell King Mark his name, which is another aspect of Merlin throughout this story, disguising himself, refusing to tell his name, either to hide parts of a prophecy or seemingly to test Arthur and his knights and show that they're not as virtuous as they claim to be because they often treat him quite poorly when he's in disguise mm. and then go, oh, sorry, I didn't realise it was you, Merlin. <laughs> that to yeah, I totally wouldn't have done any of that if I'd known it was you, but that's not the point. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the only reason I can think for why Merlin is quite often in disguise in this. So after this, after they've buried um, Lancior and his, and his wife, Balin meets his brother Balan, who finds them at this tomb while they're, while they're building the tomb. And um, in order to get back into King Arthur's good graces, um, he recruits Balan in order to go and capture King Rience, who was mentioned earlier as one of the 11 kings who survived the previous war. They do succeed in this um, and bring him to Camelot, which rather angers Rience's brother Nero, who summons King Lot of Orkney and the other 11 kings um, and makes war on Arthur through a combination of Merlin's manipulations and now the strength of Arthur's court now that he's had time to build up his forces. The Eleven Kings are finally defeated, and Britain is finally united, and Arthur's a hero. Hooray. Yay. Arthur has all of them interred properly and given a, a good funeral worthy of kings, at which point Merlin prophesies that Balin will give the dolorous stroke whereof shall fall great vengeance. Again, not truly explaining what that means or yeah. how to prevent it, but it's as ominous as it sounds. <laughs> Shortly after this, a travelling knight is killed by a knight with the power of invisibility called Sir Garlon, and Balin pursues him alone. 
as he pursues this night, it sets up some minor characters who all require healing and specifically require blood to heal their wounds, which Balin can't do upon giving regular blood. And these are people who show up later on at the end of the Grail quest as people who need healing by the Grail. Balin meets King Pelham, who I believe is based somewhere in North Wales, um, and is invited to feast with him. At this feast is when Balin finds Sir Galon, and in true Balin fashion, just straight up murders him in the middle of the Great Hall. <laughs> the man has no restraint. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> I didn't expect when uh, you. I, I figured when you introduced him, he was going to be in like one or two scenes as the obvious bad guy they get rid of. But no, <laughs> no. Th- this is a whole book devoted to him because wow. it it sets up quite a few important things. So it's it at first seems like a pointless side story, and then you see what's being set up. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he in in the Great Hall just straight up murders Sir Galan and King Pelham obviously has his knights try and seize him and there's a battle that ensues um, as Balin makes the fighting retreat deeper and deeper into the castle. Towards the end of this fight, when Balin is fighting one-on-one with King Pelham, Balin's sword breaks. I need to specify that this is not the sword that was cursed that he drew. Right. Because that comes up again later. So at some point he is using a different sword for this battle. So this sword breaks, but fortunately, Balin happens to be in a chamber where, on a plinth, there is a marvellous spear, strangely rout, which Balin picks up and strikes King Pelham. This is the dolorous stroke that Merlin prophesied. Uh. It severely wounds King Pelham and causes the castle to collapse and causes ruin throughout his entire country. Well, that's, yeah, going to the Fisher King sort of thing. Yes, this is very much setting up Pelham as the, um, the later version of the Fisher King. Merlin, obviously knowing that this is all going to happen, is nearby, rescues Balin from the ruins of the castle, and tells him, and again, I'm quoting Merlin's bits a lot, but I'm going to quote again, and King Pelham will lay so, many years so wounded, and might never be whole till Galahad the prince healed him in the quest for the Sangreal, for in that place, was part of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that Joseph of Arimathea brought to this land, and there himself lay in that rich bed. And that was the same spear that Longius smote our Lord to the heart, and King Pelham was nigh of Joseph's kin. So it turns out Joseph of Arimathea, who is a biblical figure, is many people believe that he brought Christianity to the British Isles yeah, we, after we saw the death of Jesus, earlier. and who came up earlier, yeah. also happened to bring the Spear of Destiny. To the British Isles and passed it down to his descendant, King Pelham. So that actually was mentioned in the account that I had. I just omitted it for brevity. Ah. So it is, it's like, there's like a wondrous, like the, the items being uh, in the procession going through the castle are a wondrous uh, calendabra, uh, a lance and a fabulous grail, so a golden grail. So, yeah. Yeah, so building on that and actually making the Spear of Destiny used. Yeah. So actually following the Chekhov's gun theory of if you show a spear, you stab somebody with it. <laughs> <laughs> and so to conclude Balin's story, um, Balin flees through the ruined lands from the remaining forces of King Pelham. As he flees into another country, a lady, princess of the country, asks him to protect her from a knight who has been refused entry to these lands and who is apparently a bit angry about that fact. She gives him a new shield, which replaces the shield that has his own personal heraldry on it, and he rides out to meet this knight. And they do battle, and both do mortal wounds on each other. And as they are bleeding out, they remove their helmets and realise that they are each other's brother. (laughs) Balin has just killed Balan with the magical sword that was cursed and would cause him to bring the death of someone he loves. And Merlin um, was right. And Merlin was right and shows up to tell them that fact. <laughs> you, just, you just can't let it lie. I have to not only be right, but have everyone know I'm right. Yeah, he does again. This is again to set up a part of the Grail quest because he then takes the cursed sword, once again inters it in a stone, suspends it above a lake, and again says that only the person worthy of taking the Sangreal will 
be able to draw that sword. Hmm. I wonder who that might be. Yeah, I wonder who. <laughs> uh, so now we return back to Arthur's story himself. Um, we're, so I've skipped a few bits um, where, say, Sir Gawain and Sir Lancelot actually joined the court. So at this point, start of book five, Merlin's dead. Morgan Le Fay has stolen the Scourge of Excalibur in order to get revenge on Arthur for the death of her lover. But Arthur is king. Camelot is prospering quite well. Um, you know, there's, they have a good, strong army, plenty of strong and virtuous knights. And at this point, Emperor Lucius, who popped up earlier on, sends a messenger to Camelot demanding that Camelot pay tribute to Rome. Yeah, it's uh, very similar to Geoffrey of Monmouth. In that yes, so it's much earlier on than it showed up in Geoffrey of Monmouth, and it works out slightly differently. Because obviously at this point, Mordred isn't part of the court. And so obviously we know that this won't be where Mordred's betrayal occurs. So Arthur you know, amasses his armies, travels through Europe, gets the assistance of King Ban and King Bors. Um, it has similar stories such as having to fight a marvellous giant, as it's specified, um, similar to your version. Um, they march on Rome and Gawain has a battle with Lucius. Um, doesn't kill him. Later on, they um, Gawain also does battle with a Saracen and turns these Saracens Christian and gets them to aid them. And then with the aid of the rest of England, Kings Ban and Bors, and these newly converted Saracens, Arthur successfully conquers Rome. So he does, in fact, complete the prophecy of, uh, of Geoffrey of Monmouth's version. Hmm. They never got to do in that, so... All hail Emperor Arthur. Yeah, and people believe this to be real history as well. Nobody oh. thought there was never an English Emperor of Rome, was there? <laughs> well, I didn't, never know. I mean, there was an English Pope in that era and stuff like that. Hmm. So, you know, if you have very other, very few other resources at your beck and call, then I, I can see why people believed it. And especially if, like, the church is endorsing that sort of thing. That's true, yeah. That is a good point. So, yeah, th this chapter, while there's not really much to go into, it's quite a simple chapter, a few, you know, a few side adventures, killing giants and such, converting Saracens to Christianity and then conquering Rome. You know, it would be wasting time to go into the fine details of it. Yeah. Um, it's more, this is, this is the big thing after uniting England that establishes Arthur as the great hero, yeah. the greatest hero that England's known. Because after this point, he's very much sidelined until Mordred's betrayal. So it's kind of more the Grail quest and, and co taking a centre stage. Yeah, yeah. So firstly, it goes and set up Sir Lancelot. And as you were saying about other authors sort of sanitising the Lancelot story, this does it very much as well. Um, the thing I've found about Sir Lancelot, in his first appearance, he was very much a sinner and an adulterer and irredeemable. And then everybody after that, after that version tries their best to redeem him. Yeah. They want to present him as this paragon of virtue, this perfect knight, even though they can't because the perfect knight has to be Galahad. Um, so they have to present him as the next best thing to an absolutely perfect knight. Mm. So you get versions of the Guinevere story where Morgan Le Fay enchants Lancelot and Guinevere. Um, this particular version the actual act of adultery is towards the very end, and Guinevere is very much blamed for it. Uh, There's something about medieval attitudes towards women, unfortunately. Just a bit, yeah. Yeah, Lancelot at this point, he was instrumental in the final battle in Rome. He's generally hailed as one of the greatest knights in the land. Um, Guinevere himself names him a champion. You know, he, he displays the courtly love um, version of affection for her and is very much do, does everything he does for her essentially so he has several like short adventures that are very much just creating the stereotypical heroic and chivalrous knight so you know rescuing damsels in distress and such like he comes upon a wounded knight who needs a blood-stained cloth to heal him i think it was part of its clothing and he needed that to heal him Upon passing into the forest where the knight was wounded, he encounters a sorceress. The sorceress asks him to kiss her, but because of his love of the queen, he refuses to do so. And th because the sorceress then judges him to have been, um, have been an honest and true man, he has 
proven himself worthy of healing the other night. He passes the test and he's given what he needs. Similarly, you get stories where he's rescuing women from rapists, where he's slaying a group of giants in the castle in Cornwall, Tentagel Castle, mm-hmm. where Arthur was conceived. He slays a group of giants holding a bunch of women prisoner in that, so on and so forth. He's very much the... He, he is the model for all children's night, night stories late, that come later. The only real hint of anything between him and the Queen is that he's always described as being nobler and more polite to Queen Guinevere than Arthur himself is. That's the only real hint at that point. So it's in terms of the overall plot, it's not a major um, chapter introducing Lancelot, and he doesn't have much importance until after the Grail quest itself, until just before the Grail quest itself. Um, but it's there to show all of his virtues before he then falls from grace later on. Then I'm going to skip over Tristan and Isolde, yeah. It's four chapters or so, completely separate from Arthur from the other knights and such. It's more there so as to present the same storyline as Arthur and as Arthur as Lancelot and Guinevere in a way where they can have the knight be the bad guy and can explore it and without all of Britain being at stake. Yeah. Essentially. As, as we saw with the um kind of the, the Grail Lancelot Grail cycle. Obviously, it turned out badly, not only for them, but for Britain as a whole. So Tristan and Isolde's the, the lowest stakes version, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because they have to have the final adultery with Lancelot and, Lancelot and Guinevere at the end. This way they get to explore it as a full story rather than just this act at the very end. So it then picks up back with Lancelot um, on a quest to slay a dragon and rescue another damsel in distress, whom he describes as the fairest in the world but for Guinevere. So again, we're putting in a few more hints here. And then it just becomes overt later on in this chapter. In reward for rescuing rescuing her, King Pels of Corbenic, who again might be another mistranslation or variation in the name, because it's also hinted that he is actually the wounded King Pelham, but it's not made very clear. But he rewards Lancelot with a feast. In King Pelzer's Hall at Corbenic, Lancelot sees the king pray before the Holy Grail. Mm. And Pels tells him that the Grail will at some point be lost and you know, knights will need to retrieve it and can heal the lands. Pels himself knows that Sir Galahad must A, retrieve the Grail, and B, needs to be born to do so, mm-hmm. and C, that he'll be born by his daughter Elaine, who was rescued from the dragon. So he enlists the sorceress to trick Lancelot into believing that Elaine is Guinevere and trick Lancelot into sleeping uh, with Elaine in the guise of Guinevere, which produces Galahad later on. When Guinevere herself finds out, Lancelot is banished, and so he lives under a false name with Elaine and Galahad, and together, together he and Galahad return to Camelot at the beginning of the Grail, Grail quest. So upon Galahad entering Camelot several years later, There's one seat at the round table, which is described as being at the head of the table, which, yeah, given that it's a round table and the whole is to show everyone equal is a bit strange. The only way I can interpret it is that that's relative to the room. Yeah. And that's the only way that makes sense. Person in the middle of the room with their back to the far wall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a long rectangular room, then you have a logical place for the head of the table. I mean, even if it's round. In the various iconography I've seen of Arthur, that period whenever you show him at the round table it's always still arrayed as you say with the building so that Arthur appears to be you know prominent and at the head of it yeah yeah and that that will come up in some of my historical context as well that I'll be getting to because there is something interesting about that but this seat at the head of the table known as the siege perilous has been kept empty for the one person worthy of taking this seat which isn't Arthur. Arthur is deemed as deemed to be flawed and sits to one side of this seat. Upon Lancelot and Galahad entering the hall, magical writing appears on this seat, stating that the person worthy is present. Mm. Arthur thinks it's Lancelot. He doesn't know at this point that Lancelot loves Guinevere or eh, why he was banished, etc. But the way to prove that you are worthy of the Siege Perilous would you like to guess how he proves his worth? 
Is it pulling a sword <laughs> from a stone? <laughs> exactly. The so- cursed sword, which Balan and Balin took from the woman um, that he killed his brother with, and so on, that Merlin put in a su- stone suspended over the lake, is the challenge for proving one's worthiness for the final seat. And it's prophesied that once the Siege Perilous is filled, that's when the Grail quest must begin. Mm-hmm. Lancelot, however, refuses to attempt to take the sword. He has apparently been slightly humbled by some of his misdeeds and decides that he's not worthy. Um, And additionally, Arthur tells him that, one, if you draw the sword, you take on the curse that you will kill someone dear to you with it, or harm someone dear to you with it, and that should you fail to take the sword, should you fail to take the sword, that is when the quest for the Holy Grail begins. So no one has at any point attempted this before. Um, Sir Gawain attempts, and he fails to take the sword. Um, The other knights return to their seats, um, leaving the empty seat. An old man enters and predicts that Galahad is the one who'll take the seat and who'll find the Holy Grail. Um, So Galahad draws the sword. Mm -hmm. He vows to make his grandfather, King Pelham, whole again with the Holy Grail. And he takes the seat. And Arthur deems that this must be the moment that was prophesied where he must find the Grail. Um, Arthur holds a tournament to celebrate because holding tournaments is what Arthur does. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I'm surprised at that moment that Merlin didn't walk in and just say, just just guys, just so you know, uh, prophecy, um, <laughs> uh, someone might have made that, probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, the old man is just described as an, an old man. It could always be Merlin de- in Merlin. yet another disguise because <laughs> he does seem to know a lot. I mean, I don't think it was Merlin because, Mer- yeah, as I say, if it was Merlin, he would have made you know about it. So. Well, there were times when he didn't. But mm, you- fair enough. Yeah, but usually he made hints that he was Merlin and then said, and you'll figure out who I am later. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, following this t- tournament and a feast, the grail itself magically appears within the hall, um, lighting up the chamber, affirming everybody's faith and granting each knight present such meat and drinks as he loved best. Which doesn't make much sense. It's like, okay, we need to go and search for the Holy Grail. Oh, look, there Here's it the is. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of the chamber. And also it's the first time that, well, obviously Merlin the mentioned God time to time before, and so it's the first time where this was an actual massive religious moment, you know, and that then sort of defines the whole chapter as one big, obviously it's the Holy Grail, but it defines ev- everything at this point as, there's going to be a lot of Jesus here. Yeah, yeah. because up until now, it's been kind of like, Arthur is, a, you know, he's a righteous warrior, and he's doing this in the name of Christ and that, but it's it's not the focus. But... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So after seeing this, the grail again suddenly disappears, and so following day, 150 knights leave to undertake the quest. Galahad insists on travelling alone. On the quest itself, Galahad commits an, quite a few miracles, um, and they all have sort of relevance to biblical concepts. In a battle with a white, with a mysterious white knight, he wins a magical healing shield, which is white with a red cross, so the cross of St. George, on it, which also happened to be owned by Joseph of Arimathea. He later on uses this shield when he finds his squire, Melias, who has stolen a crown and is under attack from two knights trying to reclaim this crown. These knights supposedly representing pride and greed, the sins of Melias for stealing the crown. The squire is wounded after Galahad defeats the knights, and Galahad uses the shield in order to heal him, representing Jesus' mercy, and Jesus working through him and forgiving him. He fights seven brothers said to represent seven, seven deadly sins to rescue another group of maidens, because you've got to have more maiden rescuing if you're a if you're a virtuous knight, um, but he refuses to kill them because to kill is a sin unless God orders you to do so. However, Sir Gawain and two other knights, Sir Gareth and Sir Ewain, I believe you mentioned yep. earlier, um, who doesn't have much of a role, he's just there, they do kill these seven brothers. Galahad tells them that that was wrong, that that's a sin, um, but Sir Gawain refuses to do penance and he believes it is due to a warrior a penance enough, thus proving that he's not worthy of the grail. Lancelot, through the course of his adventures here, learns that 
he's not worthy of the grail because his deeds are for the love of Guinevere, not for the love of God. Sir Percival, who hasn't really been involved much at this point, but he proves that he is worthy. He proves his chastity by resisting the temptations of the devil in the form of a naked woman mm. who demands, demands that he lie with her and he refuses and he proves that he is chaste and true and that is then pr- deemed as worthiness of taking the grail. So Bors, again, not been very prominent until this point, is presented with a choice um, whether to rescue his brother, Sir Lionel, or whether to rescue a maiden in distress. And by choosing the maiden, he's also judged to be worthy. Um, So these three are then given a final test by the Grail after battling their way through many enemies. What do you think the test is to determine who's worthy? Well, I'm guessing it's taking a long iron-shaped object known as a sword. (laughs) You'd be absolutely correct in that. Galahad and the other knights have to take yet another sword that only a worthy person can draw. Galahad successfully claims it, proving that of the three worthy, it's him, him who gets to go on and claim the grail. From this, he enters Castle Corbinic, which was mentioned earlier on, which was where the grail was earlier on, when King Pels was praying to it. So it's like, oh, it's right over left it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we um, should probably write some of this down at some point. Yeah. Which one of you's got the grail? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... At this point, he's struck down by God and literally enters hell. I don't think it's ever oh, okay. don't think it's ever called hell, but there is a burning lake of fire. He has to put out and the fire that is burning on the body of his ancestor Joseph of Arimathea, and rescue him from rescue him from the fire, um, and so absolve Joseph of his sins. So again, another nice Christ metaphor there for Galahad. So I'm just going to quickly interrupt myself here. I'm going to add this in in post because I did make a quite glaring error. Uh, Galahad didn't descend into literal hell. After he was struck down by God, he then came to several days later and left Castle Corbenic. He came to a boiling lake, which was supposed to represent the lake of fire within hell, and he cooled the waters because the hot waters could not abide his purity. Following this, he descended into the tomb of one King Bagdamagus, who had sinned against Joseph of Arimathea, and who was burning with the fires of hell because of this, and he put out the fires of hell upon King Bagdamagus' body, allowing him to ascend to heaven and redeeming him for his sins, instead of, as I said previously, putting out the fires on Joseph of Arimathea. Just thought we should add that in to correct that because it was quite a glaring error in the original. After succeeding in doing so, he returns um, to where he where he was left in the castle. He claims the Grail. He uses the Grail in order to heal King Pelham and all his lands, completing the Fisher King cycle that we discussed earlier on. He heals Percival's sister, who is in need of healing the various other people from Balin's Tale. Then, at the very end of this book. Um, he sees a vision of Jesus, and he chooses to ascend to heaven. And oh, wow. Yeah. We just pooched him right out of there. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you've got this this pure and virtuous knight, who is the greatest knight in the land, who has the Holy Grail and wields multiple magical swords at this point. Yeah, it's a bit overpowered, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, it'd be a bit difficult for Mordred to do him, any killing. <laughs> send him back to his home planet quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Camelot is, of course, diminished by the loss of Galahad and many other knights that fell in the Grail quest, uh, and also diminished by never actually gaining the Grail. Yeah. So, because obviously the Grail vanishes after Galahad's done healing everybody with it. And so this is then where we sort of see Camelot in decline, and where Guinevere becomes very much the villain of the Lancelot Guinevere story. Oh, right, yeah. There's a lot of things. It starts off, she's angry at Lancelot for leaving her for the Grail quest, and banishes him, just like, yeah, you went on a quest without me. You didn't stay with me. Off you go. <laughs> Get out of my lands. But then he failed the quest because his deeds were for her. Yeah, yeah. He was very much in a no-win scenario. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of feeling but bad for Lancelot now. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. <laughs> when he... Because not long after this, Guinevere is suspected of poisoning a knight and demands a trial by combat, which Lancelot will be her champion, and she calls him back. 
and he fights for her and proves her innocence because God smiles on him as the victor of the trial by combat and all that. However, she's worried that this is going to cause gossip when Arthur leaves again in order to hold another tournament elsewhere from Camelot. She encourages Lancelot to go with him. Um, Lancelot, having already previously said he wasn't going to enter this tournament, has to follow in disguise so as to not have Arthur think he's a liar or that he's up to something. At this point, the woman only known as the Fair Maid of Astolot falls in love with him upon seeing him in the tournament. Um, he stays with her and her father. She begs, begs him to wear a token of her love in the tournament, and Lancelot agrees to wear this token because he's never gone into a joust wearing a lady's token before. Mm -hmm. He wins, but he's very seriously wounded, which is when his identity is discovered. And Guinevere finds out and is furious at him because he wore another lady's token. Yeah, he just can't, can't catch a break, can and, he? Uh, after recovering from his wounds, he leaves um, in order to win back Guinevere's love, and the maid of Astolot dies of grief. She has her body placed in a barge with a letter explaining what happened. Um, Guinevere finds it. It's not really explained whether she's like, okay, fair enough, Lancelot was innocent here, or whether she just gets angrier. After this, the tale of Lancelot in the cart and rescuing her from Sir Meligance plays out pretty much as you explained it. So mm -hmm. Guinevere's kidnapped, gets a message to Lancelot for aid. Lancelot has difficulties getting there, involving having to travel by cart. He breaks into the room that she's held in, in the tower, and there and then she tells him to lie with her. And finally, they commit the sin of adultery that everyone's been waiting for for 600 yeah, pages. everyone is desperately <laughs> trying to manufacture for 600 pages. Yeah, well, trying to both manufacture and avoid at the same yeah, time. Yeah, it's a little strange. <laughs> yeah, um, but again, this is used to elaborate on why Lancelot's not worthy of the Grail, because his first love will always be Guinevere. But in the final chapters of this part, it's still explained that he's a virtuous man, and that it, when he shows humility and begs God for aid, he can also use the healing shield hmm. when he heals people in, in battle after escaping. So it's sort of trying to show that he can be redeemed. He's a sinner and not worthy of the grail, um, but through his humility, he can be redeemed. However, this has also destabilized Camelot somewhat. Arthur has supposedly known all along that Guinevere loves Lancelot, but out of love for them both has chosen to ignore it until Agravain and Mordred, so Agravain is Mordred's half-brother in this version, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and it's and Mordred, who is at Camelot at this point now, um, tell Arthur what happened, and Arthur obviously has to save face by uh, pretending like he didn't know and having Guinevere executed, and, and La well, having both of them executed, even. Mordred and Agravain try and kill Lancelot under um, Arthur's orders, but Lancelot escaped. He tries to have Guinevere burned at the stake, but Lancelot rescues her. Playing to that 15th century audience there. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. In the process of rescuing her, he has to kill Sir Gawain's brothers, and then he flees to King Ban's lands. So another little thing that Merlin set up. Hey, King Ban's our friend. Lancelot can go there to try and get away from Arthur. Um, that might explain, actually, because I didn't get a chance to probably read the... Um... Lancelot can't story all the way through um, and the various bits of the uh, Vulgate uh, cycle. That may actually add a bit more context to why Lancelot killed Gwen's brothers. In yeah. That. It wasn't it was just a villain it, who killed him. Yeah, that's it. They were trying to stop him and he just wanted to, you know, not get, not see Gwen ever burn at the stake. Which is reasonable. Yeah. So yeah, Arthur, again, redeeming himself slightly for being, for his flaws, forgives Guinevere, as is the the good Christian way, um, and allows her to return to Camelot as his queen again. Um, Gawain, however, insists on vengeance because we've already covered that Gawain's not really very godly, um, and that's part of the problem with the kingdom. Um, so Gawain insists on vengeance, forces Arthur to travel to France and lay siege, lay siege to Ban's lands and try and capture Lancelot. Lancelot um, is holding... Um, Balin's cursed sword that he took from Galahad later on, and mortally wounds his good friend Gawain in this battle. As this battle is raging, that's when word of Mordred's treason reaches Arthur, and so Arthur has to abandon attempts to capture Lancelot, abandon the siege of Ban's castle. 
um, and return to England. The first battle on the shores of England, when Arthur gets there, the already wounded Gawain gets killed. As he's dying, he says that it was his fault. If he'd not insisted on vengeance, they would have been able to call on Lancelot and on King Ban for aid, and Arthur's army would have fared so much better having Lancelot with them. There's several battles as um, Arthur travels back to Camelot to face Mordred and reclaim his throne and his wife. And at Salisbury Plain, Arthur meets Mordred and they discuss a truce. However, one knight sees a snake and draws his sword on the snake. Everybody Ah. interprets this as an act of aggression and suddenly everyone's killing each other. And in this final battle, the only people left standing are Mordred for his side and for Arthur's side, Arthur himself, Sir Lucan, who's not really a major player, and Sir Bedivere, who Mm. you've also discussed. Um, Arthur kills Mordred, and Mordred mortally wounds Arthur, as most people know. Um, Sir Bedivere bears Arthur to the Lake of Avalon, um, places him in a boat. Arthur asks him to cast Excalibur back into the waters. Three times Bedivere claims he has, but when asked what he'd seen when he did so, obviously just says the sword sank into the lake, and Arthur knows he's lied. Yeah. So the fourth time he cast the sword back, and the famous scene from every movie of the hand raising out, raising up, catching the sword. We're both holding our hand up yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, we think people can see us. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and so endeth King Arthur. Sir Bedivere later on sees um, a group of women clad in black burying a body at midnight in the woods close to the lake. And obviously he thinks that's Arthur, but it's left a bit ambiguous. Mm. That's the only thing to hint at the sort of messianic return of Arthur that's quite a common trait in these stories. Uh, Guinevere later dies as a nun at Amesbury. Um, Lancelot has her buried in the grave next to Arthur's. Constantine, again, this version becomes king. Camelot is obviously very much diminished and the other knights disperse. So I've got some notes now on the historical context of that if we've got some time. Yeah, I think the only thing I just wanted to throw in was as well was the element of Guinevere repenting and becoming a nun essentially yeah. he's actually still in Jeffrey Bonner's story now I remember it ah yeah I just caught that was a that. so uh, I mean um, the, thing, the weird thing about it is you know it's obviously just like the truncated version of what you said where it's you know she is an adulteress and then just this just Arthur returning to Britain forces her to re- repent and returns to a nunnery at that point so yeah so is that that just is a bit of an early element yeah but I'm kind of glad Crofty that I that you ended up doing this section in this detail because when I'm kind of summarising it, it's, it's avoided it being too repetitive later on. Yeah. Where you've given um, the proper detail once it's fully developed. Yeah, that's it. Because th- this is the version that took everything beforehand and tries to distill it into one supposed history and then became then became essentially the definitive version later on that just about everything has drawn, following that has drawn something from. Yeah. We almost have like a series of definitive versions where yeah. every 200 years or so, someone just reinvents it and makes the new... Like you could almost say like um, the more modern retelling, the once and future king, the like the fantasy style yeah. one of it. That's almost our generation's culmination of it yeah. in some ways. But anyway, sorry, I'll let you continue. Yeah. Um, so to give a bit of historical context to this, because like I say, Sir Thomas Maury was presenting this as a history. So he completed it in 1478, um, the ninth year of the second reign of Edward IV, which is specified in the dedication at the end. But it wasn't printed until 1485, which was the year that King Henry VII was finally declared king following the ending of the Wars of the Roses. Yeah, because I was going to um, say, when you said Edward IV, ninth year, I was like, ooh, that sounds bad. Yeah. Second reign. <laughs> He's got like a year left to live. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. And then you've got Richard the you got Edward the Fifth, Richard the Third going down within the space of a year, essentially. Yeah, uh, Richard the Third, yeah. And then Henry the Seventh finally claims the throne and unites um, Yorkshire and Lan- Lan- Lancashire, and the rest is history. Mm-hmm. So unlike a lot of all, pretty much all of the versions that you've mentioned, Charles, this version makes no mention at all of the Saxons. The Saxons are never, never come up. That might explain. Yeah, that might explain why, um, well, going back to the bad 2004 film, King Arthur, 
um, why I found it weird when the Saxons showed up in that. Yeah. So I was like, King Arthur, it's like a fantasy story, isn't it? Why are yeah. the Saxons it, doing it here? It's like, oh, they're actually trying to do the older version. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some people might be confused by the BBC version, Merlin, where it does just say, yes, we were fighting Saxons off you know, in a field 10 miles away, whatever. They never really have a major presence, but it's always mentioned as they're fight- off fighting Saxons at some point. They're the, the uh, all-present distraction. Yeah, yeah. But at this point, it's not mentioned. And the main, my speculation as to why is that, obviously, by this point, Saxon heritage is pretty much widespread. In English peasantry, people are actually identifying as Anglo-Saxon, as the English identity. And so having Arthur protecting England from invading Saxons would probably annoy quite a lot of people. Yeah, possibly. So instead, the main enemies were the kings that were opposed to a united England, and then the Roman emperor, the fictional Roman emperor, Emperor Lucius. Hmm. Um, so like, obviously... People at this point would know the history of the kings of England and so know of King Alfred and the Saxons, Alfred being recognised as Alfred the Great and uniting England. So it might have been sort of a way to present Alfred's idea of an England, united England, as existing before he came to England yeah. itself, before the Saxons, as being something that originated among the, the post-Roman English people. And so as to then sort of lend it another era of legitimacy by saying that, yes, this was the precursor to Alfred the Great's idea. Mm-hmm. And by having um, Arthur's kingdom decline after the Grail quest, again, that sort of means that it does then leave the country in the sort of state that it was in for the Saxons to invade later on. Um, and so they don't really, the, the two don't really have to conflict. I don't know how they would reconcile conquering Rome with other histories. You might yeah. have something to say on that. but I mean, um, so in terms of the historical background that this is set in, the period in which you would have been contending with Rome, um, and particularly in the earlier Geoffrey of Monmouth version where he contends with Roman Gaul specifically, um, Gaul in the late 5th century, early 6th century, was conquered and ruled over by the Merovingian dynasty of France. Uh, who were not Roman in the slightest. They came from kind of like the low counties sort of region, as far as why they used to be called the Salian Franks for that region, region uh, reason. And yeah, they were Frankish. They weren't Roman. So it's interesting to see that Rome in some of these accounts is still depicted as a dominant power mm. in Gaul into this time. There was like an offshoot kingdom in the north uh, of Gaul, like the king of Cy. Tigarius or something. It was like a, a, a basically a Roman official who founded his own place for a while that was then conquered by uh, the Merovingian dynasty. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to see these kind of constructions on there. You can kind of see why when this earlier continental history became apparent and when Rome had collapsed, why people almost kind of from the 16th century onwards stopped holding it in such high regard as history. Yeah. Um, the next point I wanted to cover, um, one common thing with King Arthur is the idea of him returning as a messiah to defend England in his hour of need, and that is never at any point mentioned here. While he's proven as a hero, uniting England, defeating the Romans, etc., he is still very flawed. Yeah. He's, Galahad is the one who has the qualities of the messiah, you know, healing the wounded, refusing to kill, and choosing to ascend to heaven. Whereas Arthur, while he's while well, he's the king, he is shown as flawed. It sort of, sort of shows idea of a sort of virtue at the sort of mortal level where you're imperfect, but have have done great deeds versus the true godly virtues of, of someone like Galahad. Um, yeah, I and, mean, in the way that Arthur is described, how he like evolves from this war, it almost it almost feels like he's like this war leader as a young man, and then as things go on, he's older, he's a weaker man in yeah. his old age. I can see like parallels to the historical figure of like Edward III, who was this great warrior king of England for the first 20 years or so of his reign, came to the throne, I think, when he was like 14, 15 years old, who then later, his later reign is a period of stagnation for England, and it then only goes on to have more trouble, you know, 
Then it has Richard II as a young lad becomes king. I can kind of see, I, I, I have no idea to what degree the story is influenced by that sort of figure, but I can see a parallel going on there mm. of this figure who's weaker the longer his story is told, essentially. Yeah. The, this version of Arthur, while he did great deeds at the start, he does also lose quite a lot of single combats through, mm. throughout the earlier chapters, like the most notable when he fought King Pelinor and Merlin had to drag his ass out of the fire to get Excalibur. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's also obviously not the best swordsman in the land because there's a lot of other people who defeat him. But at the same time it was released, as I mentioned, King Henry VII um, finally claimed the English crown. And he actually used King Arthur's heraldry of the Red Dragon as he marched into Wales. Mm. And yeah. uh, Sorry, I thought you were indicating that you wanted to say something. Well, I was just going to say as well, he actually named his first son Arthur as well. I was just getting to that, actually. Yeah. Yes. Um, firstly, he, he had genealogies commissioned in order to show that he was descended from Arthur through his grandfather, Owen Tudor, um, descended from a family in Anglesey that claimed that their lineage went all the way back to the Trojan founders. And yeah, I'm not going to pronounce any Welsh names in, <laughs> in between the Trojan founders and Owen Tudor. Yeah, and, so you, you can see, yeah, it's not surprising then that the kind of the publication of this around that same sort of time, it clearly had a lot of cultural impact. Yeah. At the time. So much so that we almost got a historically attested King Arthur. If, yeah. Uh, if Arthur Tudor hadn't died, I think he, he married Catherine of Aragon yeah. and died a few within, months into the Within marriage. that year, yeah. And That's then Henry it. obviously became, who was intent, Henry VIII, who was intended to be, to, you know, to be sent to the church essentially. He's suddenly, as a very young man, his king without much training, which yeah. may explain some of Henry VIII's reign. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, Arthur, the Arthur ideal does sort of carry on through the entire Tudor house, mm. in fact, because like, like you say, um, Henry VII's firstborn son was named Arthur. Also, Henry VII arranged for his son Arthur to be born at Winchester, which at this time was seen as the historical Camelot, again, to try and add legitimacy to it and claim that this is the messianic return yeah. of King Arthur. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, given how dubious his means of coming to the throne were as well, where he was like descended from Owen Tudor and one of the former queens of England who'd eloped with Owen. I think mean, yeah. Henry the Sixth's wife. So yeah, that that was a one influence. When Arthur married Catherine of Aragon, Henry the Seventh put out a call to English and foreign knights to take part in jousting for the occasion claiming that the 230 knights of the round table will again assemble for this occasion. So he's very much trying to use Arthur to sort of boost his own status. Yeah, Henry VIII did follow in the same vein. Um, he had a 13th century replica of the round table um, that he had it repainted in order to show the Union Rose, um, the white and red roses from the Wars of the Roses, um, instead of the Grail in the centre. He placed a likeness of King Arthur at the um, Siege Perilous seat, the head seat. Mm -hmm. um, however, that likeness did look kind of similar to Henry himself. Yeah, not, it not was remarked on quite a bit. Well, you know, Henry was, you know, he's red haired, so there's the Welsh roots a little bit mm. showing there. He, he has as much claim as any man <laughs> in England does to heritage of King Arthur, that being none. That is true, yeah. Um, so it was after Henry VIII where um, the belief in the actual historical figure of Arthur um, sort of declined. There was a historian called Virgil, whose book, The Anglica Historia, challenged it and was eventually accepted as a more accurate history um, and determining that Arthur was a myth. Um, so at this point, Arthur sort of was relegated to um, plays showing more, more showing morality tales and such and showing tales of British imperialism and good deeds of the kings and such by a group called, they were a rival of Shakespeare's group, the Lord Admiral's Players. Mm. Um, and apparently a lot of their plays didn't really survive. The only other prose account um, was by Sir Richard Blackmore, uh, also known for his works such as The Tale of the Smoke Upon the Water. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to fit one rock music joke into every episode. Yeah. <laughs> Very sorry. Um, but yeah, that edition was far too expensive for me to buy and research. Uh, so the next, the next telling of the story 
by which point obviously it's known as a myth, was Lord Alfred Tennyson's um, poem, collection of poems, The Idols of the King, which was again very much based on Limot d'Arthur. But his version paints the kingdom as very much in decline from the start. The first chapter, Arthur heroically unites England. Following that, pretty much straight away, we get Lancelot's affair with Guinevere, um, which no attempt made to shift the blame off of Lancelot in this oh. case. Um, he's probably the only one who just accepts that Lancelot was the bad guy here. And then pretty much all of the other events were influenced by that. Um, Balin's killing of Garlon was because Garlon made scandalous claims about his queen and Balin was quite angry. And then upon finding out the truth about Lancelot and Guinevere, Balin went into a rage, attempts to kill Lancelot, and Balan kills him and dies in the process, defending his queen. The equivalent of Nimue, um, Vivian, um, attempts to spread rumours about Lancelot and Guinevere in order to destabilise the court and um, get rid of Arthur's allies so that she can have his ear and seduce him. When she fails, she then seduces Merlin, she learns his magics, and she traps him in a tree. Mm. So similar to the original story. I think in this case it does specify that he was alive in there yeah. um, eternally, and so deprives Arthur of his advisor. The story of the Maid of Astolot, who I mentioned earlier, um, who died out of love of Lancelot, it's before the Grail quest in this case, it remains about the same, except that she's named Elaine and is, never gives birth to Galahad. Right. Galahad, his origins are a bit more ambiguous, and unless I'm forgetting something, it is a pretty long book. I might have forgotten that bit, but Galahad is still a pure and chaste and virtuous knight and the only one worthy of the Grail. He can conquer all enemies because he is pure and chaste, um, unlike all the other knights. But rather than finding the grail, committing miracles, um, at the end he is still seeking the grail. It's sort of left ambiguous, it's sort of left as an ongoing, everlasting quest. And that one's done in a similar way to what you said about being told by Sir Bors. Telling the grail story, was it? In this case it's Sir Percival, who's become a monk after yeah. these events, telling the story. And then the ending of the story plays out pretty much exactly the same way. Um, Mordred reveals the truth about the affair, and um, Arthur goes after Lancelot, Mordred claims the kingdom, and Arthur, yeah. Arthur and Mordred deaths are the same. So this version, everything Arthur does is very much presented as futile from the start. You know, the only person worthy of the grail, again, is Galahad. The only person worthy, truly worthy of God is Galahad, and he's basically doing this eternal quest in the name of God, whereas everybody else in the mortal world is just battling futility, essentially. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the sense I get from seeing this, Crofty, is you know, the elements that are introduced at the very beginnings of the Arthurian canon, it almost seems like everything that was celebrated by the society of that day. So, you know, Arthur being this great warrior and, you know, incomparable swordsman and great conqueror of all these countries and, you know, respectively Lancelot and Guinevere is having like this, this romance story that's not held up as having like that many negative consequences to it. It's just, you know, this, this thing goes badly, but they aren't the main cause of it. It's just something which doesn't help. By the time we reach, you know, Tennyson, it, the things which were considered good and laudable by that early society seem to have almost been flipped entirely. So Arthur is no longer the great world conqueror. He is weak in many ways and mortal and flawed. Mm. And the great achievements, to some extent, are passed off to Galahad and other people. And Lancelot goes from it just being a simple love story at the beginning to almost, you know, the great evil behind it all, the, the, the rotting core of Camelot. Yeah, that is very much how Tennyson presents it. Mm. It's, it is the catalyst for a lot of the bad events that occur in Tennyson's version. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think that's more or less everything then, isn't it? I uh, think, uh, yeah, I think so. Can't think of much all more. we've got time for. So, here's some good news, Crofty. We managed to get through this in one session. Yay! <laughs> one uh, quite quite long session. I think it's been like two and a half hours when we're done. But uh, yeah, that was very interesting because um, I was a little worried that this episode was going to turn into us just 
been like, oh yeah, it's the same story the whole way through. It appears, you know, a little bit in the Wells stories and it gets developed by Jeffrey Bomber. But no, I think the way other authors interpreted it and changed it depending on their audience yeah. is almost as interesting a story as Arthur himself. That's it. A lot of the elements are common even from the very start, but every author puts their own meaning on it depending on how the culture's progressed at the time. Yeah, and it almost seems to go with this cycle of where it falls out of favour for a while mm. and then it eventually comes back because it's, it's just one of these eternal archetype stories that will never really go away. Yeah, probably the biggest British legend there is. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, thank you, Crofty, for journeying up all the way to my house. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, me, for remembering to do the research. <laughs> and thank you, audience. And thank you. yes, we'll, uh, we'll be talking to you again pretty soon. Thank you. Hello again, guys. Just Charles here again in post. Just wanted to say thank you for listening to today's show. And if you want to support this show going forward, we do have a Twitter account. So you can go to twitter.com slash the underscore histocrat where I frequently keep you guys updated as to when a new episode is coming out. In addition, this channel also is running a small Patreon, so you can go to patreon.com slash thehistocrat. And I made a slight mistake with my last video. I forgot to actually put the names of my Patreons, as I've pledged to do so at the end of the video. So to make up for that, I'd like to say a special thank you to Ancient Greek History Nexus, Andrew Jewell, Anna Seminova, A Thief in Tamriel, B, Ben Johnson, Brian A. Shamba, Caractacutus, Crabface McGrouch, Daniel Matthews Grout, Darren, E. Raja, Florin Nitulescu, Gary Wells, George Hagel, Gerald Carey, Greg Harfst, Hashim Nelson, Jane Farstrider, James Coleco, Javier Cruz, Jeremy P, Jessica Mosley, Kevin Hargrave, Krishna, Lando Shaw, Leo X, Mikaj Rojak, Mad Simonson, Marion Rakane, Matthew Levi, Matthew Spidell, Max Alesa, Michael Bennett Donahue, Michael Scott, Nick Stevens, O.B. Jean, Pat Ron, Patricia, Patrick, Paul Bertie, Peter Holroyd, Philip Wombaker, <laughs> Richard Kylo, Roy, Sabs, Sean Cannon, Shaheen Giasi, Sherbert Beetroff, Stella Marshall, Susan J. Wallace, Thomas Samard, Three Year Millionaire, Tony Borse, Trevor Ellis, Tala Labueth, Tyrell Judy, Ultima Nine, and Valora Sakura. Thank you to all you guys for helping to support the channel, and hopefully we'll have a new episode for you pretty soon.